Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Thoughts from the Movies, live today from the Union Fitness Studios, located on the North Shore of Pittsburgh. Union Fitness is more than a traditional gym. It's a place where you can transform yourself inside and out with a variety of classes based around fitness, yoga, strength, and performance training. At Union Fitness, they believe it is their duty to hold themselves and their clients to a higher standard. They practice what they preach and uphold the values that make Union Fitness the community it is. Go to unionfitness.com today and sign up for a consultation. Through Union, there is strength, and there is no greater union, maybe on the planet than a few humans that experience the same terrible movie together. And that is what we are talking about today. Gentlemen, welcome back to the studio. It's nice to have everyone back together. What's up? I think, first of all, I have to say you did a great job on that intro. You're really getting the hang of that thing. Thanks. I'm, you know, yeah. starting to grab it. <laughs> I, oh, I'm going to say this about the Family Stone. It's not that bad. Like, everybody <laughs> hates it. Like, we're, we're probably going to tear it apart tonight, but it's, eh, it's, not, it's that not that bad. bad. It's not the worst. I don't think it's the worst movie that we've watched, but I feel like we're setting it up to be that way. And I know Is Zach, Army of Zach Darkness not a fan. the worst movie we watched? Army of Darkness? Shut the fuck up. What's Army of Darkness? That was that Austin horror movie. Y'all didn't or like... Evil Dead. Evil Dead. Okay. I was going to say. Evil Dead. Oh. Jesus Christ. Yeah, but Evil Dead was like a classic film, though. You know, like I respected that. Probably like Killing of a Sacred Deer, maybe. I don't know. Was the worst movie. Go we... Good, Bad, and the Ugly. None of us really liked that much. You know. But uh, Family Stone's okay. I don't know. But yeah, it's good to be back. Yeah. Nice to be home. I Zach? fucking hated this movie. You fucking hated I, I this hated movie? I this movie. I, I honestly thought to myself last night, I think I like Clockwork Orange more. Wow. And I fucking hate it. They're, I mean, they're different, obviously, but this was dreadful to watch. Fantastic. I, yes. I just have no idea why we ended up watching it on this show yeah. when we did. Here's here's the movie that we Trolls did, right? Too. Good we question, did, Derek. We did A Nightmare Before Christmas. We did A Clockwork Orange. We did Schindler's Freaking List. Like, we're doing some solid movies here. Lucky and number then, 11. Lucky, well, yes, obviously <laughs> among that category is Lucky number 11. Best, oh. best movie of all time. But then somehow Josh goes, "Hey, can you guys watch The Family Stone this week?" And I'm like, "I guess." Like, <laughs> what? So, can you pl- I just I just don't understand. Can you explain what Yeah, what's okay. So, uh, we're in the Christmas mood. It's Christmas day, but everybody's like kind of like wound down and everybody's like hanging out and like whatever. And Anastasia Googles like, "Hey, what's some uh say nice things about Justin." <laughs> Or say nice things about it, Justin. Um, so we're all hanging out, and she's, like, going through, like, must-see Christmas movies. And the Family Stone comes on, and she goes, Josh, listen to this cast. And she reads it off. Sarah Jessica Parker, Diane Keaton, uh, Rachel McAdams, Luke Wilson, right? And I'm like, damn. This might be, like, one of those, like, cool, like, mega star things that I just wasn't into at the time, right? Because I was 15. I probably wouldn't have watched a rom-com at 15. And uh, so we turn it on. And I was laying down on the couch. And about every 15 minutes, I did this. And I sat up, and I looked at Anastasia, and I went, Are you fucking kidding me? Because it's like, <laughs> okay. So, you brought your girlfriend home for Christmas to propose to her in front of your entire family. I'm like, okay, that's kind of a weird plot line. Oh, wait, now the mom's sick. Wait, now the future fiancé is fucking the brother? Wait, what the fuck is happening? Oh, wait, that's okay because you're in love with your fiancé's sister. Yes, of course. That's That makes sense. Also, where does why is Rachel McAdams even in this movie other than to be the bitchy sister? Oh wait, the bro- which one's the brother who's gay? Is it the deaf guy or the African American guy? I'm confused. Okay, it's definitely the deaf guy. That's why they all know how to sign, right? What do, wait, why is there all of a sudden race being brought <laughs> into this? Oh wait, there's yet another sister who's pregnant. Whose husband we see once for no fucking reason, and her only reason for being in this movie is to have a bratty daughter and to lay down next to her mom because she knows she's dying? 
everything you want in a Christmas classic. It's so right? wild. <laughs> it has. It did have. That's the thing about this movie is it has like every single generic point of a Christmas movie Absolutely. all in one. It's the family gathering. It's the. I'm not sure if I love my fiance, but she's gonna meet the family, and then it's like you got. I actually like her, and she actually likes him, and like. Definitely, they try to do a little too much, and but like, it has all of the the all the tropes. Yeah, every just jammed it in there with a all the shovel. Tropes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then like two days later, I watched Love Actually for the first time. For the first time, mm. and I was like, had already said watch the family stuff, <laughs> <laughs> and it was too late to pivot. And I wanted to do a compare and contrast between the two of them. But we're just gonna rip apart the Family Stone instead. I'm excited. I, you know <laughs> what? Excited. I kind like we 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 tore apart Project Power. We didn't really tear apart a Clockwork Orange. We had some really deep conversations about it. But this one, we should be able to just swing for the fucking fences on without apologies, and it should be a lot of fun. Because there's a lot of huge actors in this that probably wish that they weren't. I I don't even. I mean, this is like a. I mean, maybe in 2005, but, like, like you said, like, oh, I saw this cast. Like, if I would have known the cast before watching it, I might have said, no, thank you. Clockwork Orange, more like Clockwork wasn't that good. Am I right, Zach? Amen, brother. <laughs> Amen, brother. No, I, I mean, the, the Everett, like, who the fuck is that guy? Oh, um, but like, yeah, yeah. Wait, German Mulroney. He's yeah. been in everything. It, 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 yeah, but, like, who the fuck is he? He's that guy who's, like, the handsome, generic dude in everything. Yeah. He's a, he's a bit, like, here's the thing with this cast of people in this movie. They're all big names, but none of them are, like, really movie stars. It's, like, a big yeah. group of TV actors. Diane Keaton's in a not movie. a movie star? Diane Keaton has, you don't know, name she's a, probably a movie star, Diane but an Keaton older movies. one. Right? She's an older movie star. I can't name one Diane Keaton movie. And Rachel McAdams, kind of. Right? But the rest of these people are TV stars at best. And this is this movie is like essentially a Hallmark movie that somehow was like an actual just standard release in 2005 that actually for, did a decent amount of money, which we're going to talk about later in the show, you know, the difference between then and now. But, uh, yeah, the cast is, is, a, is an interesting one for sure. Yeah, so actually what we are going to talk about today is on the screen. Is this movie deep or is it just dumb? Uh, we might have already answered that question. Uh, Love Actually versus The Family Stone, because I do legitimately believe, and I apparently am not the only person on the internet that thinks this, that The Family Stone is meant to be the American version of Love Actually, because there's a lot of parallels on things they tried to do. Love Actually did them very charming and heartwarming, and Family Stone made a clusterfuck. Um, then and now, which is a new segment Justin has proposed, which I'm pretty excited about. We're going to look at some of the other big movies from 2005 and kind of dissect whether or not they would have been made, how they would have been made in 2020. Uh, overrated, underrated, the acting performances. We're going to give our dream rom-com cast in which last two weeks ago, we did a Christmas movie and I did a Christmas movie using Chris Evans, Chris Pratt and Chris Hemsworth. I made a really good movie poster for it. Did, did you guys you really? see the movie poster? No. no oh, not. man. Okay, hang on. Let me pull this <laughs> did up. Did you post it somewhere? Oh, yeah. Let me pull it up on the gram. That's amazing. It's, what's, uh, the, what's the base poster that you used? Is it like the Avengers? No, I made it on my own. I know oh, okay. how to use Photoshop, you fucking asshole. Well, no, I thought you were just taking their faces. How do you think Tots from the Bench exists? I thought you were putting their faces on like an actual movie poster that oh, already no, 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 exists. No. Wait, why didn't it launch? Oh, I didn't even upload this? That's why nobody saw it. We're like, yeah. what are you talking about? Dumbass. Oh, what a huge bummer. Yeah, I do want to see that though. Yeah, yeah I'll uh we'll post it later. Um Yeah, I took like Aubrey Plaza and Chris Pratt from this one thing and then I like molded it into another picture of Lisa Kudrow and this dude who kinda looks like Robert De Niro, and then I just molded Robert De Niro's face on it, and then I just took Chris Evans from Knives Out and like put them put him behind them and then just Chris Hemsworth looking handsome just in it. Nice. Brilliant. Definitely <laughs> got to post that. Yeah. Uh I don't know. This is a whole bunch of fucking shit I can't read. Um And then uh we're going to finish it off with better or worse than and we have a list of uh nine other rom-coms. 
uh, that we're going to compare the Family Stone to. But let's get to our first topic of the night. Is this movie dumb or, or is this movie deep or just dumb? Um, there are a lot of people who love this movie and they kind of gravitate to certain, I think, parts of it and talk about how, like, oh, I remember the Christmas when we all found out my mom was dying or, hey, that actually happened where my brother's girlfriend fell in love with me and he fell in love with her sister or, oh, I have a deaf gay brother. Like, there's a lot of little pieces that people apparently lock onto with this movie and will tell you that it's real deep. I'm not so sure. Yeah, I mean, those people are fucking stupid. <laughs> it's stupid people everywhere, I guess. But, uh, nah, this movie's it's just dumb. I mean, uh, I, I don't know. So, like, I always think that, like, in my life, one of my goals is to find myself in a situation where I think I'm on What Would You Do with John Quinones. Wow. You know what I mean? Okay. Are you familiar? No. Dateline? No. It's like the series they do where they like set up these like awful scenarios in public where like these two diners are at a small American cafe. I think I vaguely woke up once in the middle yeah. of one of these like at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, it's like okay. they're white, their waitress is black. They're gonna say horrible racist shit to her. Will anybody do anything? Yeah, yeah. okay. And that's kinda what I felt this movie was. It was just like I was like so first off, it's like the cliche, like she's a New York executive. Yeah, they're going back to New England. Like, yeah, you know, and it's they're the family is just so fucked. Like they're right. so obnoxious, and the shit they said to her, I was like, if I was in the if I was around these people for more than five minutes, like. It would have been the shortest movie ever if it was like a documentary about me visiting a family. It would have been the end of waiting. Yeah. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. You're cool. I'm out. Yeah. Like, it was just like the most egregious shit. And then, so, like, there are definitely times where it tries to be, like, deep and shit like this. But the <laughs> when they're at dinner and Sarah Jessica Parker's sister is, like, talking about whatever the fuck it was. And Sarah Jessica Parker is saying, you know... The mom's, uh, Diane Keaton, says, like, I wanted all my boys to be gay. And she was like, well, like, do you really mean that? Because, like, it's it's hard for like, gay children, like, growing up. And the fact that, like, nobody at that table understood what she was saying, mm -hmm. I was just like, this is the dumbest movie ever. Because there's no way that she, she didn't say anything, like, offensive. Right. At all. Right. She was she just was like being inquisitive, if anything. Yeah, yeah. She was like, is it not difficult for like gay children like growing up? Because like there's enough difficulties like growing up and like right. being a child. And and everyone was just like, and then you got fucking coach slam in the table. And I was just like, what the fuck is this movie? Well, like, and, this is so stupid. And then I think one of the most unnecessary moments in the entire movie is that entire dinner scene. But then like one of the most. Like it, 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 like it makes sense, I guess, but like also was real fucking awkward. Was like, and I guess maybe because I actually liked this part when Diane Keaton throws the fork down at his plate to get the deaf son attention, but like he's been interacting with people via sound the entire time. Yeah. So it's not like he didn't hear her. He maybe can't understand what she's saying, but he can at least register noise. Yeah. We're aware of that, right? And then she signs to him, like, you're the most normal one at this table. <laughs> she turns to Luke Wilson and goes, now I need a fork. And I rolled over laughing. I was dead. It was the most, like, bizarre little scene yeah. inside this, like, really tense moment that did not need to happen in any way, shape, or form. But, I think what you just said kind of sums up the entire movie. Yeah, in that but it, then I need a fork. <laughs> no, but the the way that scene is designed and built is so uneven uh, tonally. And a lot of the scenes in the movie are like this. And I, I think it goes back to more of the writing than anything, than the editing or anything. But it's so, it's so here and there and sort of scattershot. Like that scene is a very tense, dramatic scene about Sarah Jessica Parker's trying to fit in. But she keeps saying, like, digging a, a worse hole about implying that the son is challenged and, like, him being gay is a problem for them. Thanks, IMC Foot. And um, 
And so they have this really tense scene where, you know, everyone gets upset and it's very emotional and everything. And then there's like this comedic beat at the end, which is totally out of place with the rest of it. Right. So it's just it feels very awkward in that it's like unbalanced. It's like this scene. What is it supposed to be? Is it supposed to be this heavy scene or is it supposed to be like they're trying to keep the comedic tone going? And that's like the whole movie. It's like you'll go from one scene, which is very serious and heavy to another scene that's completely the opposite. And then back to that one scene like. I remember w- there's uh, the part in the movie, one of many examples, it's like uh, Dermot Mulroney is walking down the street with uh, Claire Danes when they're supposed to be out looking for yeah, Sarah Jessica they're Parker. they're just on a date. But they're just on a date. They're like <laughs> walking around downtown and they're talking about like, did you ever think that like, you know, you were just being forced to do this stuff in your life? And then it's like cut to the bar. They're all right, drinking right, and having a good right. time and like joyful and drunk and merry. And then it's like cut back to... I just I have feelings for you, like this deep conversation, like this. What you met this girl like twelve hours ago? So good, and we're just yeah. bouncing around like that. That's the 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 best word I can describe this movie is just uneven, like yeah. the whole way. I think it's it. a great way to describe it. Yeah, like the biggest dramatic piece between Emirate and Claire Danes' character is this conversation at the bus stop, like please don't leave, I love you, and the entire time it's obscured by the bus. <laughs> Right. It's also so fucking weird too, because he's like gripping her up, like you can't go. Like, yeah, you've known her for twelve hours. Yeah. What the fuck is happening? Yeah. Right. Like this is like rapey shit, bro. Right. Like, what the fuck is going and on? And then like, if that is such a passionate love affair, we don't even see them again for the rest of the movie. She showed no interest in this man at all. Zero. Zero interest, and he's like, you can't fucking go. But then like, they're together at the next Christmas. <laughs> We only know that because we hear them talking about them. We don't even see them. We kind of like see them come in the door in the background, but we don't see that they're actually together. No. Right. I think that the stuff with the mom, I will say, like there were some emotional beats in the moment or in the movie that landed for me. And I'm like, there, this is a nice scene, and I'm feeling a little bit emotional about this scene. But it's just so out of place with the rest of the movie. You know, when when the the when Cheryl from Haunting of Hill House, who's the pregnant mom. Oh, Elizabeth Reeser, yeah. Yeah. From Twilight. Um, also, the mom in Twilight. The mom and everything. You've not seen... I've, I've seen, like, in... Is it a show? I, why even Wow. Lie? I don't know. You should check out... You would like Haunting of Hill House. Um, anyway. Uh, so when she goes and lays next to um, Diane Keaton on the bed. Great scene. Um, like, in that, the, the fork scene Is would it? be awesome if the scene wasn't so weird before that, right? The whole fork bit was actually really moving, and she's, like, signing, you're the most normal one here, and, like, she knew she had to throw the fork to get his, like, it was an awesome little beat, right? When they all fall down, when the egg yolk shits all over the ground, and they're all, like, laugh, yelling at each other, like, there's some really nice beats in it, but then there's also Emrit finding out that his mom has cancer, and maybe the second worst dramatic cry I've ever seen from an actor. The first one being Cedric Diggory's dad (laughs) in Harry Potter. That's my son, my boy. Like, but like, he's like, he's like being an asshole to her for like 15 minutes in that scene. And then she's like, I know, I know it's hard for you to not be perfect. We have no idea he's perfect except for one reference to an MVP trophy from Little League. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) Right. And I mean, she's trying to talk him. She, she's like using her being sick to like talk him out of getting married. Right. Like, bitch, you're fucking dying. Like, yeah. Let him live his life. You're checking out. Like, and then what a selfish bitch. But then she, but then he's, she's like, you know, I'm dying. And he's like, mom. And then he like collapses in her arms. And I'm just like, your fiance is fucking your brother. You fell in love with her sister who shows no interest in you. And you just figured out your mom's dying. And that's what you got for me, bud. Is like a, a a cry smile, like mom, like I, I, you would be bent over dead. And what, were they, what were they even talking about? Like a fucking totem pole or some shit? Yeah, yeah, I, I, like, I don't even remember. Yeah, I don't. I won't say the movie's dumb, but I will say it, it does try to do too much, and I think therein lies some of the uh, problems with it. It's just it tries to put in, like we said, all the cliches of a family yeah. Christmas movie. And couple that with not only trying to be a comedy, but also trying to be a very uh, dramatic, you know, subplot of the sure. mom dying. And it's just, it doesn't land. There's just too much happening. Yeah. So, I mean, I won't say it's dumb, but it's definitely not well executed. Right. 
I can agree with that. I, I have some I have some more questions here. Okay, let me I go some, back to the discussion. Some, I'm sorry. So a, a, a couple things. Um, when Sarah Jessica Parker storms off mm-hmm. from the dinner table, and you know, why doesn't her sister fucking follow her? Great. Her question. sister doesn't know any of these fucking people. Great question. I don't think anybody calls Sarah Jessica Parker until like late that night. Like they just go looking for her. And then we have a scene where Emmerit like calls her like from his bedroom. Like yeah. she has two cell phones. Oh, that's you, right. You see this. Yeah, Nobody they established that the cell phone's attached to her hip. Nobody calls her. Oh my god, that's a great point. As soon like within as soon as we met Luke Wilson's character, which I mean, let's be honest, he's the fucking worst Wilson brother. Like he's nobody's first pick. But also one of the only redeemable parts of this movie. Yeah, the only good part. But yeah. as soon as I saw him and he first talked to Sarah Jessica Parker, I was like, oh, they're going to end up together. Yeah, because he's got a boner. Not even that. Just like you can, you can just tell. Like you can just – and just, I was just They're like, total opposites. They're the complete yeah, opposites. Yeah. It's just yeah. like nothing in this movie was like surprising except for how bad it was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, it was almost so bad that like the next thing – okay, go out. I, I, I don't mean to, the, the fucking dream, the dream story. Yeah. I, I had a dream about you last night and I'm like, okay, like, you know, cool I'm, way to hit on it. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. You were a little girl in your flannel PJs. And I was like, okay. He was like, you were shoveling snow and I was the snow. I was <laughs> like, what in the fuck is going on now? So this is where I think that's perfect because that's actually, I thought about that a lot. Because I was like, what the fuck does that mean? And I think that actually is, is fairly deep. I don't think so. Because if you think about snow, it falls hazardously. And without without care, it's on everything, and it's scattered, right? And she is cleaning it up. She's organizing it. She's pushing it off of the sidewalk so that she can go on with her life. She's, like, collecting the snow and making it into something yeah I maybe mean, once again like he, he also doesn't know this chick so that's like a fucking reach <laughs> the pause from you two was incredible and then one more because this is maybe the most egregious thing of the whole fucking movie okay so it's like christmas morning where this whole thing goes down yeah, where, like Luke Wilson scenes. they're fighting. Yeah. She drops the thing and she's covered in fucking yeah, food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She goes into Luke Wilson's bedroom uh-huh. that night. Still covered in shit. Still wearing that shit. Yeah. She's in a house with three other fucking women. Yeah. I get her shits at the hotel, but like he well, was like, You smell like throw up. Why the fuck would you not change your shirt? I don't know. Like there's, I, I agree oh, with Justin. I, I I agree with Justin that there's so many things about this movie that are just like, the delivery of the line is like weird with the atmosphere. Like, well, it, it, but there's so many other like, it's like nobody tried. I like what you were talking no, about the inn there. Do you like there's the scene where she gets in the car like, yeah, I'm going to check into the inn, and then at the next scene she's making food in the kitchen, and they're like, yeah. oh, how did how was checking into the inn? Yeah, and it's like totally skipped over that one. I think um, the other thing that really bothered me that stood out was the sexualization of Jessica Park, Sarah Jessica Parker. Which should just never be done. What? <laughs> okay. Uh, Back hey. the fuck off, my Zing. girl. Okay. All right? Jesus. Carrie Bradshaw is a weapon, and she needs to be respected as Don't such. you dare. Okay. Don't you dare. Um, very... Short, short side note. Very famously, there was a uh, a gift that was purchased for my family called Battle of the Sexes. Yeah. And it was supposed to be guys versus girls. Yeah. And my brother and I were playing against my mom and my uh, wife. And my brother and I knew all the characters from Sex in the City. And my mom and my wife could not name one. <laughs> I've never seen it. Sex in the City's awesome. Is anyway, it? yeah. Um. But, like, Sarah Jessica Parker's character, like, basically undressing herself at the bar. Did you notice that? What? Yeah, so, like... Uh, undressing? She was letting loose. She was letting her hair down. But her, like, bra was out in public. It's, it's she had a white England. shirt and a black bra. A fuck, yeah. I don't, it's not that uh, See, I thought it was kind of weird. 
And like yeah, that was her letting her freak flag fly, like Luke Wilson but said. But like hair down and jacket off, and maybe like a couple unbuttoned. But like that's what it was. Or navel. Eh, I don't think you're reading too much into all that. All right, anything. all right. Well, that's fine. Um. All right. So yeah, Is, are we good on? Yeah. I think we've decided it was just dumb. We tried to be deep, but it just yeah. it didn't get there. Shallow pool, kitty pool. Uh, it I, went off the rim. And I mean the subplot of this: the pregnant sister's husband. I just Eliz- Elizabeth what? Reeser's character really did not need to be there. No, no. no. I don't know why she was there. No. She had the daughter, I think. Yeah, that was, was her, her daughter. Yeah. yeah, but even the daughter didn't really do anything. But she then, had a couple of lines, and that was about it. And then they ask her like, if her man's coming on Christmas Eve, and she's like, no, he'll be here tomorrow. Right. And then we go all the way up till Christmas night when he shows up, and nobody has said anything like, "Where's your husband?" Yeah. Yeah. Where's yeah. your husband? No at? idea why she was necessary. Yeah, I just mean, rounding and, it and out. And he only came in to say who's. Who's Amy Adams making out with in the – or Rachel McAdams making out with in the car. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, waste. Mm. They hate this movie so much. That is what I miss. Agreed on dumb. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all I have is the synopsis on Google, and I already hate it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's brutal. And part of what was supposed to be the idea for tonight, at least in my head, that I did not communicate with anybody, so it's not on anybody, is that this felt like – an American version of Love Actually, where you have star-studded casts, intertwined plot lines that all kind of connect up at the end, and like everybody knows each other, everybody kind of ends up together kind of thing. But one of them does it beautifully and charming and is one of like the best like little sweetheart movies I've ever watched, and then the other one was The Family Stone. Yeah. Do you think that that do you think I'm onto something there? Or do you think that that's just kind of like happenstance? It's really interesting. The two. I mean, I I would love to hear like if you have like a point by point breakdown of their similarities, like why you think that? Because okay. I would like to hear your arguments. So like, uh, one of the main themes on both of these movies is relationships aren't always as they appear to people outside, right? Alan Rickman and Emma Thompson versus Dermot Mulroney and Jessica Sarah, Sarah Jessica Parker, right? Um. The cast comparisons, Love Actually stars no fewer than pretty much everybody, right? Bill Nighy, uh, Colin Firth, Liam Neeson, Emma Thompson. Why is this not in importance, order of importance? Kira Knightley, <laughs> Andrew Lincoln. Yeah. I mean, even the minor characters in Love Actually, you have Martin Freeman in there, you have Chiwetel in there. I mean, you have Andrew Lincoln in there, like obviously from Walking Dead. And from uh, Sherlock and the Hobbit and such, so, like even the minor characters in Love actually are became pretty big people. But that's right. that's a big key difference because I mentioned earlier that uh, Family Stone is sort of like a Hallmark movie, and that the level of actor in it are more so like TV people and stuff like that. Love actually has genuinely like film stars in it who have had lengthy, successful film careers, and people that are beloved as actors in their respective roles right hugh, hugh grant, grant as the bumbling right, you, you know yeah. comedic guy liam neeson now in is in the ass kicking role and emma thompson for her quirkiness and talent as a screenwriter and, and such so everyone in love actually like that's actually a movie star cast yeah whereas family stone is not that's a big difference i think they're both ensembles and they both have name recognition but uh, in different senses i think uh feather shell the chips chips uh, change from show to show. Um, and actually, Two Beers Deep this Thursday is not Two Beers Deep. It's Chips New Year's Rockin' Eve. Oh boy. We are doing a four-hour spectacular from four to eight. Um, everybody's going to be on. These guys are going to come on uh, at like seven-ish to talk about some movies. Um, and the Chips Chips that we will have for that night, I guarantee you will be worth cashing in on. So, Watch the entire show today. Save up your chips, chips, and let's burn them tomorrow. Um, <laughs> bitch, I'm a fantastic. Dancer. I wanted to see Zach try and dance. I bet I you it. kind of are. I, I really am. I really I doesn't really surprise am. me. Y'all are gonna be impressed. Yeah, we'll see it tomorrow. Uh, well, yeah, Derek will be on tomorrow, leading the circus that is whatever. Oh, um, so what else you got though for these two? What's yeah. what's more the comparison? Love uh, actually, and Family Stone. Intertwining storylines, right? Where like you're kind of bouncing around in both movies but love actually it doesn't feel like bouncing around it feels like you're checking in on this character that you like 
this movie's like, oh, wait, what? now we're back here. Oh, shit, now we're yeah. in the kitchen. Now we're back with the mom. What's Luke Wilson doing? Getting high with dad. Okay, but they're talking about mom dying. Didn't Luke Wilson know that? Doesn't he live there? Yeah, but you know what? Maybe he didn't notice. Okay. Love like, Actually, it's like Love Actually takes place all throughout London. Yeah. And it's yeah. all these different characters and occupations and storylines, whereas in the Family Dodge Stone, it's all condensed into one family and one house and just like cramped in that one atmosphere. Yeah, and I think in, at least in the Love Actually, they make it like interesting. Like yeah. Hugh Grant's the Prime Minister. This mm-hmm. one dude's going to America to meet ladies. Yeah, the uh, the that one guy's dude's awesome. like a music. Yeah, uh, this is just like. Yeah, it's like, like oh, he's a fancy Wall England. Street executive yeah. or whatever. Like yeah. they're just it's corny as archetypes. Fuck. Yeah. Um, so that was another one. Uh, why we understand Love Actually, but get lost in Family Stone. We kind of just talked about that. Apparently both the these writing. movies <laughs> decent writing. Apparently both these movies are cult classics. <laughs> I don't think yeah, that this is okay. a cult classic there at all. There is a, a And Love Actually is not a cult classic. I think that's just a classic because that did a lot of money at the box office. Okay. So a cult classic is a movie that sort of bombs when it comes out and then picks up a following over time, okay. right? But Love Actually was I mean it's definitely bigger now than it was. Yeah. But it did it started out as a pretty decent success. Okay, cool. But Family Stone is also surprisingly at least at the box office, more successful than you guys might think. I mean, it was made for 18, and it did almost 100 worldwide, which You're, is a success for sure. I think our opinions of the cast are very different. Yeah, 100%. Than, than mine? No, you, both of you and me. Yeah. Because I I think of like a Sarah Jessica Parker as being somebody that would draw me to a movie, and I might be alone in the world on that. Um, I'm aware of it. But also, like, you have um, – Rachel McAdams in it, who at in 2005 had just come off of Mean Girls. Yeah, and this was the same year that Wedding Crashers came out, which I'm guessing mm-hmm. would have preceded this as a holiday movie. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, Diane Keaton is a big name, at least in my house. Diane Keaton's like. Kind well, of look a at. Big do you name. have that poster for it? I mean, the, it's a good looking poster. Like, I mean, and not the one with the ring finger, which is yeah. stupid, but the one with actually like all of the. Yeah, I mean that's you know. I would have been conned into this. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's generic as shit. Like, I can think of 18 million other movies that are, like, an ensemble cast that use the same, yeah, that's you know, <laughs> layout and everything. But it's that's what they're designed to be. These are movies that are sold on the, you know, the, the people in them, so to speak. It yeah. looks like a Redbox movie. Yeah. Now, oh, for you know, sure. Like, that's a for classic sure. Redbox. Yeah. Like, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But, like, so I think, like, the the large ensemble cast, I think, was something that they had in common. Mm-hmm. Um. Sometimes relationships aren't meant to be. That's like a big theme in both of them, right? Keira Knightley and Andrew Lincoln versus Luke Wilson and Sarah Jessica Parker, right? Like, I thought you hate me. Actually, he's madly in love with you. And then you have these two total opposites with Luke Wilson and Sarah Jessica Parker, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Another thing with the relationships in both movies is sort of the age range of them, right? It sort of ranges from the younger to the older. And even though this is obviously set within a family... Still a sort of a broad range range of those. Yeah. So I think there's – I don't think it's – it's like you were saying earlier, like um, Earthquake and Volcano. Like it's yeah. the same fucking movie. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, but I don't think that they're too dissimilar, and they're both kind of like about like family chemistry and families like not, not – not holding up the way you expect a family to in a Christmas movie. They're all kind of based around Christmas, but they're not – christmas like oh santa claus presents you know what i mean Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's i don't know it's kind of like a shitty like reboot exactly yeah it's like the american version they saw love actually become a massive success and they decided as hollywood always does to copy something that was successful and try to make it their own and they just it didn't connect i mean simon curtis who did love actually is a very talented uh, filmmaker who's done a lot of movies that people really love right. and they're very charming and heartwarming and character driven and the guy who did this I think his name, last name is Bazooka Tyler Bazooka or some <laughs> shit like that who uh, or Richard Curtis I'm sorry not Simon Curtis um, you're abs- Thomas Bazooka yeah who also who did done... famous movies like Big F and Deal or Big Footin yo Big Eden Big why Eden. why is that <laughs> like okay anyway uh, Monte Carlo and uh, don't even try it with that one. The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Society, which is a movie on Netflix my aunt really likes. But, uh, yeah, I mean, this guy has not really done anything else. Um, and whereas Richard Curtis has done many movies 
that uh, we all know and love. Uh, about time, four weddings and a funeral. Pirate Radio, Josh. I think you like that movie a lot. Pirate Radio is in my top 100 movies. We will watch it for this show <laughs> because it is – it's as charming and heartwarming as love, actually. Yeah, and that's really? Richard Curtis. Yeah, that's him as a writer and director. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's part of the people involved in it for sure. But I, I feel your argument for – it being a, a watered down American version yeah. of that. It's just that's kind of how I felt. Yeah. Do you remember the whole kind of like outcry when Sienna Miller called Pittsburgh Schittsburgh? Oh yeah. So one of the producers of the Family Stone is the guy who directed that film that was shot in Pittsburgh that Sienna Miller called Pittsburgh Schittsburgh over. And I was like, that's fitting. This movie is yeah. shit. So. Okay. But fun fact. <laughs> um. So this movie was released in 2005, and Justin, this is your segment, so why don't you walk us through it here? Yeah, you know, so as we're talking about this movie on the show, and everyone's kind of shitting on it and talking about some of the, the negatives of it and everything, when I was watching it, um, the, the biggest thing that really struck out to me was how times have changed so drastically that this movie, The Family Stone, was a typical theatrical release in 2005 that had a fair amount of success at the box office despite being fairly not that great right and you know with the people that are in it and i just i couldn't help thinking how times have changed so much in terms of movie going and how this would never ever see the light of day today ever in a million years maybe as a as a netflix get buried hulu. in streaming movie. No, no, hulu yeah i mean hulu some release. it would it would be a stream Amazon movie Prime. and it would get Crackle. buried yeah, <laughs> nobody would ever hear about it at all. But this was actually 15 years ago. These types of movies came out in theaters and they were built just around the cast with their super generic premises that, you know, who didn't matter if they were any good or not. People still went to see them. Right. But now it's so different. And I couldn't help thinking about that throughout the entire movie. I'm just like, man, the movie going landscape is so different now than it was in 2005. And I personally think in uh, in a worse way, because these types of movies, the thing with the movies that are put out in theaters for the past five or ten years that Hollywood has really latched on to is that as the superhero movie and the franchise have grown and become bigger and bigger and done more and more money, and as the conglomerates that own studios have seen the potential to make a billion dollars with their movies, the middle ground of filmmaking has sort of shifted away from the theatrical experience. So it's now pretty much... 20 and under or 80 and over in terms of budgets you have indies and you have blockbusters and the whole middle ground is kind of being wiped away uh from theatrical or going to tv in long form as limited series like the queen's gambit and like mm -hmm. you know little mm -hmm. fires everywhere mm -hmm. and stuff like that so the the character driven movies that you used to see you know the forest gumps and the things like that they they just aren't made as movies anymore and i wanted to kind of examine that and uh, take a look just at a few other movies from 2005 that were some of the bigger earn earners of that year and just talk about would they exist today? Would they survive? How would they come out? Because there are so many options, right? You have streaming, you have TV, you have, you know, the movies that are in theaters now but are now franchises or, you know, tiny little indies. You know, it's just so different. I, I wanted to talk about movies that were commercial at the time that are not anymore and just uh, kind of, you know, see awesome. what would make it today and, and kind of what your guys think of, you know, how they would be presented. So I pulled five or six from the, the list of the highest grossing domestic movies of 2005. And of course there were some like war of the worlds, you know, your Spielberg movies and your, uh, you know, your big franchises, star Wars and such that were up there uh, and your big animated movies like robots and, you know, Pixar stuff. But then there were other movies like this that were pretty successful at the time so there's five or six movies here, and I just want to get your guys' thoughts where you could see them being released today. If you could, if, you know, it, what vein, would it be a TV show? Would it, you know, what would happen? So the first one is Coach Carter, which uh, Samuel Jackson, you know, coaches a high school basketball team to a state championship. And that has definitely become a call classic. So did you guys see this back then, or have you seen it at all? I've not seen no. Coach okay. Carter. So, yeah, I mean, it's a very, it's a character movie that's just Samuel L., being inspiring it's like remember the titans kind of with basketball sure. and on sort of a lesser scale yeah so do you guys what do you think about this movie making it today where could you see it if you could see it being made at all didn't they just make this movie with ben affleck this year oh the way back yeah, where, yeah he plays the alcoholic basketball coach yeah yeah i mean very similar to that that movie was a warner brothers release it was in theaters it did not do very much money uh and sort of 
shows the problem that those types of movies aren't drawing crowds anymore. Anchored by Ben Affleck, a big star. Yeah. Um, but I wonder if it would have done better elsewhere. I don't know that this movie gets made. Yeah. With the success of things like uh, Last Dance, Last Chance You, all sports documentaries with the name Last in it, or the yeah. word Last in it, <laughs> um, I feel like we're very much right now in a phase of we want actual, we want to glorify actual people that played games. We don't want to talk about somebody who maybe, like, I think Coach Carter actually existed, but maybe he's, like, partially fictionalized and stuff. Like, that's not very popular in sports movie culture right now. We're much deeper into like, um, oh, uh, there's a Tiger Woods documentary, Tiger, two part yeah. doc coming out for HBO. I think that's more popular now. I think you're less likely to see something like this. You would see something closer to Miracle than you would Coach Carter. That's a great point, actually. I mean, Zach hit it on the head when he said this movie kind of came out last year with the way back, and that movie did not do a lot of business at the box office. But The Last Dance, phenomenally popular. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting. The Last point. Dance, I can't imagine how much money. Like, ESPN had to pay a fuck ton to get it done. I know that because they had to hire. Here's the shit about that. They had to hire. I'm waving my beer bottle at you like your dad. <laughs> like, hey, you fuckers, get off my lawn. Um, so The Last Dance is made by Michael Jordan's personal production team. Okay. ESPN just paid for the rights. Yeah, it was expensive. Gotcha. And, I, yeah, I think Coach Carter was a real person, so it would probably be just a better documentary people would want to see nowadays. I, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, but uh, in, this, in the same vein, like, I think uh, Jamie Foxx as Tyson, like, I, I, I think that will do well, but it's mm-hmm. because it's Mike Tyson. Right. You know, it's right. like – a, a cultural fucking icon, right? Yeah, not yeah. just not a guy who maybe yeah, once coached yeah. AAU. Well, in that's Philly. and that's the thing. That's what a movie has to be nowadays. And I remember uh, this struck me as so powerful. I was uh, a couple weeks ago. I did uh, a general Zoom call with uh, a woman who's one of the heads of the studios, uh, like subdivisions, and she was saying that what she is looking for now, and what the the people that work at studios are looking for now, um, in terms of the movies that they commit to making. It has to be important, and it has to be urgent. It has to be a story that requires being told, and it has to be fucking amazing right now if a studio is going to make it. And that's just so different than what it is. It's such a high bar to set, you know? Like, there has to be a powerful message or an, an amazing story or, like, just the, the right cast of character. Like, the only reason Once Upon a Time in Hollywood got made was because it was fucking Brad and Leo, right? I yeah. mean, that's like that's the kind of movie that doesn't get made in, anymore, yeah. and it was only because it was those guys. So, like, to have the bar set that high for people who are working at a studio, I mean, I know Netflix, for a fact, only wants franchise movies or genre, which is comedy, sci-fi, that kind of stuff. No drama, wow. none, of, none of that at all. So, it's like the, the bar has just been set at such a higher specific level today. That sucks. Cause like, yes, agreed. Jurassic Park doesn't get made then. Jurassic Park is a big – that's a big idea. That makes, that's like okay, a franchise that gets movie. Made? Yeah. What about um, P.S. I Love You? No. It. Do, I mean, but it, it's, no. It's funny to hear you say that, though, because, like, we get so many shitty, like, reboots. Like, I know. That doesn't yeah. seem to me yeah. to – like, right. does the all-female Ghostbusters, like, meet that criteria? Well, there's there you have it, it's right? That's That's taking a classic beloved franchise and giving it a modern uptake of – you know, feminizing it, but right? So that could be that to a lot of people. That's important, which is like fucked because it's not an important story. You know what I mean? Right, and that's the problem I have with like the new Ocean's Eleven re- reboot, where yeah. they took stories that were really popular and movies that were great with all male cast and are redoing them with female cast, and it's like you're just sort of redoing it with females. That's not a great idea. Like, do do a movie like that, but make it its own thing. Yeah. You know, like try to do something unique and original. There's a movie that's supposed to come out in January called 355 that Simon Kinberg, who's like the, the keeper of the X-Men franchise, directed and wrote. And it stars Jessica Chastain and Diane Kruger and Penelope Cruz. And it's like five different nationalities of women playing an international coalition of s- spies together. Yeah. So it's like a big ensemble spy movie with all these big name female characters. And that at least is trying to do something original. And I respect that. You know, it's not just a reboot with female characters. Did you see the trailer? I did see the trailer. Yeah. 
Is this are we watching it right now? Uh, I'm just playing it for everybody. They can't hear it, but yeah. So I mean, yeah. But the, again, the idea is here. At least you're trying to do something original instead of rebooting something for the umpteenth time. But that's where that's where a studio sees safety and that they know an audience, a certain audience, is going to come out for you know a reboot of a popular franchise or, or something like Labyrinth getting rebooted at Sony, which was a a, what? a movie of people loved. You know, that's become a cult classic. They're yeah. rebooting it. Yeah, they're doing a reboot of Labyrinth. Yeah. Is Del Toro doing it no <gasps> no um but oh, um, oh that's gross that's so gross that movie is so personal to him how can you fucking I'm reboot sure he'll it be involved as like an ep or something but, Ugh, yeah, that makes not, me so. sick but but you know i 100 percent agree with you zach and it's just the, the it's but like do these movies do well like they don't even commercially do well do they oceans 8 did okay uh ghostbusters was not a success so it's you know it's hit or miss. I, I don't think of any off the top of my head that have been resounding successes. I mean, Wonder Woman absolutely has been, but that's not exactly the same. That's not yeah. rebooting something with, a, with you know, a female character. So, so. I, and I just kind of like was scrolling through my list of 100 movies. Breakfast Club doesn't get made today is what we're saying. Not at all. No. Well, I mean, it, it could, but it's just not by a studio who used to make those kind of movies. It would right. have to be, you know, indie, self-financed, and then maybe at a, sold at a film festival to a distributor. Probably would be so picked like up a by a streamer. So, like, 24 maybe would have made it. A24 is the only one making those no. kinds of movies anymore. They're the indie and studio. And Magnolia. But even they're, but they're getting... they're putting they out, have, like, the best fucking movies. They do, but they also, you know, they partner with Apple now. They have yeah. an output deal with them, and yeah. a lot of their movies are awards movies, and they don't do a lot of money. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the movies again, like Dances with Wolves, like all these great movies from the yeah. '90s that were big Oscar character winning movies that did yeah. a ton of business. They just have fallen by the wayside, and it's a real shame. And that's what kind of inspired this segment because the Family Stone in 2005 was an easy yes. It's like okay, we got this ensemble cast. It's a Christmas movie. Script's generic or whatever, but just put all their faces on the poster and go make it, and it was a success, right? Right. Nowadays, not the case at all. I wouldn't get Freedom Riders. Nope. Nope. It's one of my favorite mm. movies. Mm -mm. Uh, so no Coach Carter. No Coach Carter. Flight Plan's another great example of this. I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen Flight Plan at all. Yeah. With Jodie Foster, uh, which is a great fucking thriller. A great It film. would be a Netflix movie, though. I don't – so they did it's a – Bird they, Box. They actually – there's a similar movie that came out this year called 7500. Okay. 7500 starred Joseph Gordon-Levitt as a pilot of an airplane, and the plane was taken over, like hijacked, and it, the whole thing is – takes place on the plane yeah. have either of you guys heard of that uh -uh. i exactly. saw the i saw that it was like an amazon original yeah and they fucking amazon. pounded the trailer in front of every amazon show yep amazon for like months but i didn't see it because it looked like shit it's amazon so even if it was yeah. great you wouldn't know because you yeah. don't hear about that kind of stuff yeah. a studio wouldn't make it and this is an another thing you know it was a star driven movie jodie foster on a plane for an hour and a half do it put her face on the poster absolutely let's do it i'll watch anything jodie foster's in uh, oh, so yeah. so I'll say this movie would be made, but in, on streaming. Yeah, because of Netflix that, that or Amazon yeah. or yeah, yeah, for sure. Hitch. Justin, <laughs> Josh, we love this movie so much. I do. We both do. Yeah. This movie, like this movie's fucking timeless. Not a fan. You don't like Hitch? I've only seen parts of it to be you honest. You don't like uh, love? <laughs> do you not like love, Zach? I don't think I love Do you need a Will hug Smith. right now? I don't think I love Will Smith anymore. Get the fuck Oh, Get that the makes fuck. me sad. But to be fair, his last decade of movies has been pretty terrible. But, like, yeah. this is the last probably. This was hit. Yeah, he was the at last, his height right here. Yeah, this is, like, the last good Will Smith This is, like, movie. I, Robot territory. Yeah. Like, I Am Legend Yeah, but territory. I fucking, I hate I Am Legend. I love I, Robot. That's, I, I mean, but this like, is the same movie, movie, but, but yeah. Smith, though, yeah, I, I get that people love this movie. But so this, yeah, romantic comedies right now are especially have fallen by the wayside because people just won't go to the theaters to see them anymore. The Big Sick did like 60 million, and that was considered a huge win a couple years ago out of Sundance because it was a Sundance movie. Right. But it, yeah, but yeah romantic comedies and comedies just in general are really struggling right now, and our people are making less and less unless they're really, really do you think, high concept. Do you think that's why we don't have movie stars anymore? Think I th about I how actually... many movie stars got their fucking boot in rom-coms. All the big ones that we pine over now mm -hmm. were in a rom-com to start. Pitt, DiCaprio, McConaughey, all fucking rom-com guys yeah. at the beginning. Yeah. Affleck, Damon, Wahlberg, all fucking rom-com. Yeah. Well, I think the two coincide, right? Because the movies that we're talking about, including The Family Stone, are star-driven 
movies. Mm -hmm. And that's and as we've talked about on the show many times, movie stars aren't really a thing anymore. And right. stars don't drive movies anymore the way they used to yeah. in the 80s, 90s, even in the early 2000s. It's just they don't do it. It's outside of maybe The Rock or Kevin Hart or, yeah. or whatever, you know, two or three people. And they're not even movie stars. They're just celebrities. They're big brands who are yeah. in movies. Yeah. Hitch would not get made today. It's really I – I think Hitch the story is so good though that it it like A twenty four Magnolia picks this story up and runs with it. I don't know that the the idea of Hitch is that it, I don't know if it hooks you enough. You know, oh, I, I, I like it's I, hard to say. It's hard for me to remove myself and become a conscientious objector on it. Yeah, because I love this movie so much. Agreed. But like, it's such a cute movie. I, I know, and it was a massive success at the box office. In, in well, the yeah, idea Kevin is like James, he's a Will date Smith, doctor. Uh, what's her fucking name? Eva Mendez. Yeah. Thank you. So he's a date doctor who gives advice to people about Damn their love life. I mean, it's just it's not a big enough idea for today's world. I don't think. I mean, there's probably someone that would that would make it if you had the right, just right. the specific right people in it. But it'd be very tough. Okay. How often do you guys go to the movies? Let's say you know before COVID. Yeah. Okay. Uh, once a month. Okay. I'd go probably at least once a week. Okay. And then watch, you know, others at home. Yeah. I, I was I was pretty much a religious once a month movie consumer. Okay. But that's again I feel like that's I am probably in the same boat. Yeah. But I feel like that's probably atypical for like the general masses. I agree. That's on the higher end actually. Because that's yeah. twelve times a year yeah. or yeah. more. So that's yeah. pretty yeah, that's on the higher so, end. So and I I might I might be the outlier here, but I think for a while and maybe maybe to an extent well, I don't know, it's hard to say now because of COVID and all that. But I mean and I know it only happened once, but after the whole like Aurora uh Dark Knight, did you guys feel a certain way about going to the movies? I doubled down. See, I, I'm, I'm like a. I, I think people are fucking sketchy. Like, yeah. No matter where I am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like the movie theater where it's like dark and shit. Yeah. So like for me to, I, so like even once a month, like luckily like there was like shit I wanted to see, mm -hmm. but like, just speaking personally, like there's something I have to like want to see for sure. me to go to the movies. Sure. Like. I mean, fuck. What was that like? Ten, like probably eight years ago. Yeah. And, like I still get like sketched out like the movies. And yeah, shit. but that's exactly the mentality that people have nowadays. I need to go see one. this movie and I need to see it in a theater. Yeah. yeah. Now me as a cinema goer, I want to see every single movie in the world in a theater because I just think that experience makes everything yeah. better. Yeah. But most of the people think the same way that Zach does, which is like to go out and to spend all this money to, to do the drive, you know, to take the kids and get a babysitter or get snacks, everything like yeah. I really need an excuse to see this in a theater, especially if I could just fucking rent it at home and watch it on my TV at home. That's the true crisis of today's movie landscape is coping with that exact attitude. And it's not wrong. It's just that yeah. with Netflix and these other options that have presented these ways that we can just watch movies at home like the family stone or whatever like no one would no one would go no one would bother going to a theater to see family stone now they would just but they would probably watch it at home if they had access to i'm it. just yeah i'm going through i have my top 100 movies up and like every other one i saw in theaters like out of the top 20 i saw 10 of them in theaters mm -hmm. so i think like and like there's like the like um Pacific Rim is on here somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's not on here if I don't see it in theater. Right. Yeah. There's something about when you're in the theater and you're feeling the the rumble in your seat and you're everyone gasps at the same time. Like I saw mm -hmm. Paranormal Activity in theater. That was one of the best it's... movies I ever saw in fucking theater. It was lit. Yeah. It was lit. Because like everyone's screaming at the same time. Everyone's like. Because you're, you're all victim to the steady, like, the lockdown camera, yep. right? You yeah. got somebody's yelling some funny shit in the back, and then, like, some kid starts crying. Another another awesome movie theater moment. My mom and I, because we're big Ben Stiller stands. Absolutely. Fuck anything. Ben Stiller, I'm in. You saw, like, nice. you talk about movie stars. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. We saw Night at the Museum in theaters when the caveman jumps out and lands on the street and turns into dust. Yeah. <laughs> Mom and I doubled over laughing. Oh, man. And then this little kid starts crying. Then another kid starts crying. Then another kid starts like, the whole theater is like, ah! And, like, Mom and I are laughing even harder now because yeah. we realize how terrible people we yeah. are. <laughs> 
I, but that's the collective seeing. That's yeah, the experience. Yeah. I feel that way about The Hangover. Do you guys do you oh, remember seeing that? Oh yeah. I mean, that's like when you have the whole theater roaring. I mean, there's nothing that beats that. That was uh, Twenty One Jump Street, mm. and this is the end. Mm-hmm. Both in theaters. Yep. And like, I was for both of those movies. We got there late, and we were the front oh. row, oh. which is the worst. You're like, yeah, yeah. You're looking up at it. Didn't affect me at all yeah. because that's how Still fucking fun. funny and like awesome that experience was. Yeah, like I mean, I've watched it at home, so I know it's 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 good at home. But like, Fury Road. Oh, I can only imagine. Oh, Mad Max. I, yeah, I saw oh. it, I saw it opening night, and I was just like, this is like. Like movies were one thing, and now they're they're this. Like this is the standard right. for like, right? Or like even uh, uh, the like, um, the roadshow version of um, Hateful Eight, mm-hmm. where you're mm-hmm. sitting there, and then there's an intermission. Like mm-hmm. that's fucking fun. Like yeah. that's it's an experience. Yeah, yeah, like it sucks. It and sucks that's that, well, that's what know. the superhero movies. That's what Marvel has done because. And this is a credit to them. I think they what technology has gone to these days, and you can you can put such incredible things on the screen that that's what people have gotten used to, and that's why they all keep going to see those types of movies. You know, it's because they're so incredible and realistic, yeah. and and what you can put on screen nowadays is amazing. But it's also, I, I don't know, people just you know, I think that even if it's like a little romantic comedy or like a, a family drama, it's still more powerful in the theater. I but, agree. You know, um, especially when you're like fighting back tears because you took your girlfriend for the first time to a movie and you're like, I'm not crying. Yeah, yeah. I cry. <laughs> I, I cry Ugly during cry. every movie. Yeah, for nice. sure. Uh, we just got three more of these here. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Longest Yard. The Longest Yard I put on here because agree. Uh, let me know if you guys agree. I mean, this would just be a Netflix movie because Sandler has a Netflix deal. But this movie, he was putting these movies out left and right. They were making $100 million and everyone was happy. Yeah. I just love how many professional wrestlers are in this movie. <laughs> and then also Nelly. Yeah. Just cause. Um, Nelly yeah, man. would be replaced by David Spade. Yeah. <laughs> I think, but I think you're on to something though, that if this is on Netflix, it doesn't have the wrestlers in it. It doesn't have Nelly in it. Like it's, it's a, a, a much, wa- much more watered down cast yeah. than what's on here. Yeah. And you just don't hear about it, right? I mean, right. of all the Sandler's Netflix movies, he's done like, I don't know, eight or nine of them by now. And I bet you guys probably have only heard of half of them and only seen, you know, a small percentage. Why you got to keep them. bringing this up? You want to get into this? I just want to know if you've seen The Ridiculous Six yet. I've seen <laughs> all of them. No. Um, um, I've seen a lot of them. I've seen the majority. I've, yeah. How many times have you watched Huey Halloween th- the entire way too, through? Too many. I've watched it three Once, times. And Are it was serious? too many. Yes. Jesus Christ. I love I, it. I love it the wrong feels, Missy. It feels so much like old school Sandler. I'm all in on because Huey it's Halloween. the Water Boy. Yeah. yeah, he just plays Bobby Boucher growing up. <laughs> uh, I do believe yeah. you have my thoop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but again, that's it, it, for the last you know six or seven years. This has been a Netflix movie. Yeah, I, I think you know. you're right. I'm not. Uh, this might be a conversation for another day, but I just want to throw it out there, especially with Disney making this push for like. Eight Star Wars series, mm. fucking how many new Marvel series mm-hmm. are, are movies dead? No are movies dying. No, 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 no. Listen, everyone is saying that they think they are because a exhibition is struggling with COVID right now, and b um, because of like you said with like Disney Plus has the Mandalorian, all this stuff coming out on TV. But for the exact reasons that we were just talking about, it's why exhibition will not go away because that experience is irreplaceable. Yeah. Now the movies might change as what's in the theaters, but Going to see those paranormal activities or those marvels, whatever it is, as a group, whether you're laughing or crying or whatever, together you can't. People want that still. You got to see End Games, End Game in theaters. I haven't seen like any of the Marvel movies. Like, but like, you know what I mean? Like, you could have watched every single one of those movies at home, but then when End Game got announced, you had to go to the theater because you had to be there with the people. But do you, Marvel doesn't give a fuck. Yes and no. I mean. Marvel, what, what any, Warner Brothers is doing now with HBO Max. Well, here's the thing: is that movie theaters right now are in a very tough spot with COVID. So they're yeah. they're not have you know the industry is shifting because of that. But if a movie can make a billion dollars, uh, uh, you know the studio's still going to want that. Even though honestly, a movie studio is only like 
ten percent of the actual like you know Warner Brothers is I think eleven percent of AT and T's overall portfolio. Disney's like thirteen percent of with the theme parks and all that stuff. Yeah. But um, but they can still Disney's whose portfolio? Disney. Like ABC and Disney, the actual conglomerate of Disney, they have the theme parks. They have. Oh, you're the, saying the movie studio? Yeah, like Disney, Disney. movie okay, studio sorry, of the overall Disney, yeah, right? Yeah. But um, but yeah, so there's still opportunity there to make a lot of money on a movie. But everyone sees streaming as the future. That's why they're pushing people towards that. In particular, Warner Brothers with putting all of their movies on HBO Max the same day that they're being released in theaters next year. I mean, that's partly driven by COVID. And by HBO Max having a very soft reception so far compared to Disney Plus and Netflix's subscriber numbers. But that's what every every movie studio is being controlled by their larger media conglomerate. Yeah. And the conglomerate sees streaming and direct to consumers, DCU, um, or DTCU, DC, whatever it is. That's the future. And that's what everyone is focused on. So, and maybe this is what I, I mean more so like. I don't think the next Tarantino movie is going to be straight to Netflix. I don't think the next Robert Edgar's movie is going to be straight to Netflix. Mm-hmm. But if you're Disney and you announce that, hey, we're going to make three more Star Wars movies and they're going to be whatever, you're going to get another Star Wars movie directed by Tiko Wati or whatever his name is. Tiko Wati, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's directing Rogue Squadron or some shit. Patty you know? Jenkins, who directed Wonder Woman, is doing one. Yeah. So. We'll give you we'll give you a couple movies, mm-hmm. but like after the success of the Mandalorian and like the money they can make off merchandising, why not just make eight shows? Well, they're, like, they're that's doing such both more now. of them. Mo- yeah, yeah, but like they're I I feel like it takes more effort to create eight shows than it does to make like three movies that are gonna follow like a sequential storyline, like you know the last three sets of Star Wars movies. Like they're making the movies because like. You know, we expect there to be Star Wars movies, but they're really like, we can make so much more money just by making these fucking 30 minute TV shows and like licensing the shit all like all the stupid fucking merch. Sure. But that's also that's an extreme scenario where you have that brand that has those, you know, merchandising opportunities and that world that you can build out of. But what worlds are bigger than like Star Wars and like Marvel? You know, like the two biggest. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. They they don't have to fucking make real movies well that's anymore. why disney and that's for for the past few years disney has only actually released in theaters like seven or eight movies a year yeah because they're just doing those brands and each of them makes a billion dollars and then they throw like the occasional jungle book in there or whatever but a, a movie studio used to release 25 30 movies a year disney literally i think the last year not this past year but the year before in 2019 i think had eight which is ridiculous that's one every reboot that's once a month it was all reboots it's all branding it's yeah. their brands yep it's live action remakes of cartoons, Disney, uh, Pixar, Marvel, Lucasfilm. That's the Disney brand now, and that's all they're gonna make. There, there's no other movie that they're gonna make anymore. Yeah, outside of those. That's brands. crazy too, because it's like fucking shooting your own goddamn foot off. Because Disney's original properties are what made Disney the conglomerate that it is. It is fucking Lion King and Cinderella and Beauty and the Beast and Jungle Book, the originals mm-hmm. that created the conglomerate child like bubble that is disney so like to say that they're not going to make original ip anymore it's just fucking dumb yeah and i mean if if you have like you know disney and marvel making this push where they're going to put out like you know their blockbuster star wars movie once a year their blockbuster marvel movie like what's going to support like an amc theater with like 30 showrooms like in the next you just you have those movies in all the theaters yeah and they're sold out too uh, for maybe like the first week, but like if they're also nah, released on like streaming, Endgame is in there for yeah, like Endgame, a month. Endgame was in theaters for I, almost an entire year. Yeah. But I see what you're saying because I bought yeah. tickets for the Rise of Skywalker opening day, the day of. Yeah, and got got to see it that night. Oh. Yeah, you know what I mean. But oh. no, but those movies have such a long playability. I mean, for months at a time. I mean, in the yeah. theaters. But if they, you know, that's a new thing that's COVID has caused a disruption with is the exhibition window, which has long been an issue in the movie theater for how long before a movie can be online, on streaming, on video on demand after it's been released. It used to be 90 days that it had to be in theaters before it could be on on demand. And that's been a big battle between the theater chains and the studios and has now shifted this year 
Universal has done a deal where now they can put a movie on their streaming service after only 17 days, depending on the business it's done. And HBO Max is doing movies the same day on that service as in yeah. theaters now. So that whole thing has completely shifted this past year. I just think in like 10 years, like to see like what would what would be like an A24 movie now, you'll have to go to like a Harris Theater or some shit, you know, like a one – a one screen kind of establishment. That's well, kind of but a even A twenty four has Apple now. They'll all be on Apple's streaming service. Yeah, I mean there there are certain yeah, yeah like <laughs> I, I don't mean to depress it, no, no, you. No, you're but right. Like, you're yeah. right. But like there, but there are still at this point in time, you still have your focus features and your searchlight, which are based on award season prestige movies uh, that get smaller releases and will do like twenty or thirty million and whatever. That that like that's still an area that exists. It's just shrinking every year and getting yeah. smaller and smaller and smaller. And my hope is, and what I think is going to start happening after Avengers Endgame and sort of the wrapping up of all the phase one characters, I think the Marvel movies and the superhero movies, comic book movies are going to just start to decline now. And five or 10 years from now, it's going to get to a point where it's going to, it's all cyclical. It's always cyclical, right? So right now the dramas and the mid budget movies are all fading away. People just want to see the big stuff. That's going to change. I think by the end of this decade, I think people are going to get so tired of that and have such a superhero fatigue and a comic book fatigue. They're going to say, where are just like the good, character movies anymore like i i think that's going to come back at the by the end of this decade and i, I think they'd have to because a lot of like you know you're fast and you're furious like these people you know vin diesel can't be that guy in 10 fucking years yeah but yep. like you were saying like there's no we don't have any new movie stars now yeah so you like got, who and, stars in these new and, franchises in the old you, you and, can't keep it going like mm-hmm. i'm thinking like shia labeouf jgl guys who still have some years left in the tank were made before TikTok, Instagram, that kind of stuff. Like, so there's gonna be a bubble, but then like it's gonna come back. Like movie stars will come back. I don't I think that so. movie stars will come back you because think... social media is not going away, and that's what has led to the decline of movie stars. They're so accessible, and they need to be accessible. I mean, look at Brie Larson. I think this is a great example, and yeah. I love Brie Larson to death. But Brie Larson was an indie gal. Yes. For her entire life. And she was a great actress. Yes. Then she got thrown into Captain Marvel, yeah. which did a billion dollars and is a huge success. COVID hits. And what does Brie Larson do? Starts she doing starts a YouTube channel and starts and putting out, you know, every couple weeks new YouTube videos yeah. and saying, hey, check out my new video on YouTube or whatever, which I guarantee you was her team saying, you need to utilize this time to build your brand for the future and that's what it is all about nowadays social media has just completely obliterated what it means to be a movie star there's no mystique to it anymore there's no glamour to it anymore it's just that person's always around so you've completely de- demystified what it means to be a movie star yeah and that's why they're not going to be able to come back i don't think no matter how talented you are you can either be on social media and have that presence and always be on people's minds, which is negative in its own way. Or you can be like, you know, Denzel or Charlie Hunnam or like whoever, you know, these guys who don't have social media and are just forgotten about. So you just put Charlie Hunnam and Denzel in the I, same Yeah, I mean, listen, they, they're guys who I know for a fact don't have social media. For okay, God's sake, okay, okay, we, okay. Listen, listen to these names. Will Smith, Johnny Depp, Tom Cruise. These are the biggest movie stars in the world of the last yeah. 20 years, and they all at one point or another in the past five years have gotten on social media and had to start building that persona. And these are guys in their 40s and 50s. It's like no way yeah. that Tom Cruise was like, oh, yeah, I think I should just sign up for Instagram and start yeah. posting shit. These are yeah. people telling them this is where the world well, is Well, and they're now. not even doing it. A team is doing their social media. Maybe Will Smith is. He's taking like, advantage of it because he's a very smart guy. And right. He knows how to build his brand exclusively. But these are, you know, this is what movie stars have had to do. Think if you're like Anna Joy Taylor. Yeah. If you're like a girl that looks like that in 2020 and you have ambitions of becoming an act- actress, unless you're really in it for like the love of acting, what stops you from just like never leaving your house and making like 100K on like an OnlyFans? Or starting like a vlog People on do that. fucking YouTube. People absolutely do that. Shit, Justin's got IG. It's a great point. The man who <laughs> barely knows how to use his fucking phone has Instagram. Well, that was for the ladies, obviously. <laughs> yeah. God bless. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Just sliding into God DMs. Bless. God bless. That God is a fair bless. point from my buddy Nick. Um, 
but yeah, so that's that's the reason why movie stars are not going to come back. But I, and I can only hope that eventually the fatigue of these types of movies that we're seeing now sets in and we sort of revert back to a you know a better. I variety. still think though, in that same logic that you just gave about the fatigue of superheroes, I believe the fatigue of seeing TikTokers do movies will wear off. There's a reason the kid with the high pitched voice, Freddie or whatever, didn't become a movie star. He right? had movies though. He had movies. They didn't do anything. You don't want to see FaZe yeah. Clan do a soft reboot of Reservoir Dogs? Yeah, well, hang on. <laughs> that actually might be cool. <laughs> uh, but I think I think it will come back. I think the pendulum in pop culture is a fucking swing, and it will always come back to that sweet spot for you, and then it'll swing out of it. But guess what? It's coming right back. It's just how fast it swings back and forth. I, and... I know we're like so fucking off the rails I'm, here, uh, but this but is like, so much better than talking yeah, about the family yeah, stuff. Yeah, fuck the family <laughs> stuff. And so, like, my uh, I have a buddy Ryan that's like really into like movies and shit. And so through him, I'm in this like, you know, I'm I have like a glimpse into I guess what is like film Twitter. Okay. If film Twitter is the future of cinema, we're absolutely fucked. Oh no, we're we're done for. What is I'm, film Twitter? What does that mean? Just like these like people that like, you know the fucking rag on movie like every day and at this point i think it's like become like a thing but every day there's somebody that's like let's do this again which is better rise of skywalker the last and it's just like and then these people are like i've been working on this short film for the last like four years and i showed it to my mother and she thinks i'm a really good boy and it's just like i think at a certain point like culturally with like uh like people just see like YouTubers and they're like, it's just someone like at their house. Mm -hmm. And like, I could do that, mm -hmm. you know, or like we have, I think like definitely now more so than in like when we were growing up, there's like this sense of entitlement or whatever. And I think that like, especially when we see things like the reboot of Ghostbusters and shit, there's so many things being done that aren't like done well, but just being done because like, people will love this you know i think there's like less you know unless you're like a tarantino or like a roger edgars or like the safety brothers mm -hmm. like there's only certain people that seem to be like really tr trying to craft like interesting stories and interesting films and i think like the people except for you know the few diamonds in the rough that hopefully like get the exposure that like these people you know have got that i i just think that like the quality of like story and idea coming out over the next couple years and just the eagerness to like write something that's going to be like woke and celebrated. That's going to be, you know, sought after more than like an original, original masterful like piece. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're making what the audiences are telling you to make. Yeah. And 100%. the audience is the same. That's, we've already that, seen that. Yeah. yeah. And they listen to like kiss FM and it's the same top 40 songs played every fucking hour and a half. Like they're not, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think, I think a lot. Um, yeah. First off, Film Twitter is just called film school online. It's it's horrid. It, oh, you it sucked. I used to go yeah. around and kick over bees nests and tell people why Spielberg and James Cameron are the best directors ever. Yeah. Like that was my bit. Like I would have these friends who would be like, Oh well, Kubrick is a mastermind and be like, How much money did Kubrick make? Oh, because Spielberg made that in one movie. Yeah. And that would just fire them up to no end. Um as far as people making things that audiences dictate. I think that has always been in film. And we just like just going through these movies. Okay. Um, okay. Longest yard was what? Who fucking cared? Like the, the people told them that they liked Adam Sandler. People used to like this movie. It's a reboot, right? Yeah. Boom. Mr. And Mrs. Smith. This is, I want to watch I want to watch this hot couple have sex on screen. Boom, we made this movie, right? Um, Hitch. Oh, Will Smith needs a new movie here. How about this rom-com, right? Then you have this, like, sports movie. Cool, right? This is an original film. And the only other one on this list, but this is technically a comic book, is Sin City. For what are you talking about? Original films? As far as like not making what the audience has dictated to you. The audience uh. dictated Coach Carter, Hitch, Longest Yard, Mr. and Mrs. Smith. The only ones they didn't dictate 
mm-hmm. were Flight Plan and Sin City. Well, no, here's the difference between what you're talking about and what Zach is talking about in okay. the sense that Zach is talking about the subject matter of the movies, and you're just talking about movie stars getting movies made because they're movie stars, which is a different thing. I don't think I am. Yeah, you're talking about Hitch is made because Will Smith needs a new movie. Longest Yard is Adam Sandler needs to do this movie. But the audience like, is dictated that they liked Will Smith and Adam Sandler movies. Yeah, yeah. They, they like these movie stars, and they'll go see these movie stars' movie. It doesn't sure. matter what they're in. They'll go see it. But, yeah. but the content in the movie star are the same thing. No. In, in, yeah, they are. I, I, I don't think so. Because let's say I've, – I've seen City maybe like twice. Okay. But there are movie stars in Sin City. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. So let's say you come up with this concept now. Who do you cast in Sin City that people fucking want to go see in that movie? That isn't like you can cast Daniel Craig in Sin City, but it's just it's James Bond. You can cast people from the Marvel movies, but it's that guy from the Marvel movie. Mm-hmm. You're still only going to see because there's a star. Like they're gonna crank out these shitty movie ideas because people are going to be they're like people are going to think this is a try a triumph you know but then like who do you put in them like there's it's going to be a mix of not great ideas being made just to be made and then like there there there's no movie stars left it's like the perfect storm for it just to like fucking collapse well then let me ask you this could it be the return of the director it is becoming the return of the director. Actually, yes, it can be. And I think the, those voices are sticking out now because movies used to be, really 10 or 20 years ago, they were star-driven. They were driven yeah. by the actors. Yeah. Now they're driven by the filmmakers. And right. I mean, obviously, the content and the subject matter is, is the biggest thing. What's but the big word you always use? Auteur? Auteur filmmakers, yeah. 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 So I'm like the Safdie brothers are a great example of it. Uncut yeah. Gems was a massive success yeah. for A24. It did yeah. like 50 or 60 million because those are directors that people want to work with now. But that's that ties into everything where these filmmakers, people don't necessarily respect, I think, the brands all that much, like the Marvel stuff and everything. It's like people will be in them because they're big paydays, but the quality of the material is not great. It's not something an actor can seek their teeth into. They would much rather be Amy Adams going to do, um, you know, that show with Patty, uh, Patricia Clarkson, Broken Little Pieces or whatever that show's called. Yeah. Or like, you know, they would rather go these these limited series or do these interesting things in TV or work with smaller indie filmmakers who are doing material that actually sort of challenges them in an actor and tickles their creative bones and like makes them work for it nowadays, which the studios aren't like their material is not that way. Like, so go let them. They, and they are, they have to, there's no because other way that they can do them. If you're an Artur, what is it? Otor. Otor. Yeah. If you're an Otor filmmaker, you probably want some raw talent. That's not necessarily a big name anyway. And then you kind of mold them, and then they become, like, your guys, right? Like, all those – like, every art o- OTOR movie we've talked about in the past, like, two weeks between Clockwork Orange and Kubrick's guys versus, like, Tim Burton's guys, like, they they kind of get them relatively unknowns. Maybe they've done one or two things. They saw them in, they liked them, and then they become – Johnny Depp's not shit without Tim Burton, Right. Like, well, you can argue, mm-hmm. yes, Johnny yeah, No, no, he I'm not going to talk about that. But, like, but. that's what I think, like, if the director comes back, the movie star will follow. Whether or not that movie star then becomes a social media presence, I don't really know. But I think the idea of a movie-driven movie star and directors and, and actors pairing together to create powerhouses again mm-hmm. is about to come back. Well, I don't know that that's ever left, but what I'm saying is that Talented people in Hollywood want to work with other talented people, and a lot of people. That's just life. A lot of people have. How taken, the fuck do you think you two got here? <laughs> obviously, that's the only reason I'm right. doing this show. Um, but no, a lot of people have. They are very open about this. I took this job because I wanted to work with this director. The script wasn't good, but I wanted to work with whoever this Alfonso Cuarón or Guillermo del Toro. Like, obviously, they would have good scripts, you know. But like, yeah, it's like people. People want to work with those types of people, and. That goes for, you know, like middle-aged movie stars, like, you know, the Benedict Cumberbatches and Nicole Kimmons or whoever, like, they're not going to be doing, well, I shouldn't use them because they both are in big studio superhero movies, but like that level of people 
are not just going to be into like the, the franchise studio movies a either they're too old or b like the role's not interesting or good enough for them like denzel is great you know he's a little on the older side but He's not going to be in a fucking Marvel movie or whatever. But he still wants to work with talented people. That's why he's doing Macbeth with the Coen brothers and Francis McDormand. Which, by the way, is going to be fucking amazing. But, um, yes, but yeah, Benedict so, so Cucumber. those people do want to work with other talented people. But the thing is, what you were saying about movie stars, like they'll, they'll still be movie stars. And that's fine. But the ability to grow new ones is not going to be possible because of the advent of social media. I mean... Tom Holland is kind of a movie star, but only because of Marvel and Timothy Chalamet and Saoirse Ronan, who I think are like the only ones off the top of my head that are that talented that could be movie stars. He just gave you one. Who? Anna Joy Taylor. Anna Joy Taylor. Yeah, but I mean, she's not a movie star. She was not in yet. the Queen's Gambit, which was great. And she's been in movies, but she's not a movie star. I, I, don't, I don't think she will there's be. Like, there's no, no prestige. I don't think she will be. Yeah. I don't think I she disagree. will disagree. I don't have anything to present to you as to why, other than that. I genuinely believe, and this is more me being a like a hard, like the idea that the job of a movie director existed captivated me from such an early age, and that's all I really like obsessed over for a while, especially through college. Like I want to be a director. I want to be a director. I want to be a director. Like, I wish that was in my job title right now. Like, if Thoughts from the Bench became a real fucking company tomorrow, I would put director in my title just so I can fucking say it. Yeah. I still think there's little kids out there that want to be directors, and I still think there's little kids out there that want to be movie stars. I I mean, I, I'm not – again, the director – the notion of directors going away and auteur filmmakers and all that stuff, that's – those those are coming back, and yeah. if anything, there's more avenues for them to work with because right. of the advent of streaming and, and the more opportunities in TV. So there's more of those opportunities. So that's right, and 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 movie stars are not going away. They're just it's it's harder to create new ones. So that's like they're the older generation is existing and rising and everything. Like in Feathershell, that. listen, I love Timothy Chalamet. That dude is fucking talented, and I love to watch him and everything. But is he a movie star? Does he have that prestige to him and that and that sort of almost otherworldly quality? I I don't think so. He's not Leo in the '90s. He should be, but he's not because it's not the '90s. And and my whole thing is like we know about. Think of it this way: so like we're kind of in the sphere, we're movie guys, so we know about like, you know, do you think your mom knows that Uncut Gems was a movie if it wasn't for you? Hmm. No. Have you seen Have you seen the Lighthouse? I I started it. Okay, <laughs> but like, if you weren't a movie guy, how would you know that the Lighthouse was a movie? How would you know that Good Time was Memes. a movie? Yeah, ex ex exactly. Yeah, you that's know? about it. And so, like, you know, he, Robert Edgar does The Witch, and it's like I I think it's a fantastic film, but you know, Anna Joy Taylor's in it, but I don't think it's like a a box office like smash by any means. Mm -hmm. But you know, you have a real actor like. Um, William Defoe, who is like, I see potential here. You know what I mean? But I don't know that there's unless you're in the movie sphere already that you don't know about some of these like interesting up and coming directors. And if you're just in the general mass, that that's the kind of movie you're interested in. Yeah, I hear you guys, and I and I I accept your points, and you're probably right, but I can't let it die. Well, that's that, and that's the thing. Like, I don't think any of us want it to die. Yeah, I'm just not as optimistic about the future yeah, of not, what could be. Can't give up on as, it. As I, yeah, as no, I, I mean, be. content will always be king. It's yeah. a very common saying. Yeah. And there's more content now than ever. So right. there's more opportunities now than ever for talented filmmakers to shine through. I don't. the The world has definitely shifted from stars driving content to now it's more focused on the filmmakers again, which yeah. is good. Yeah. Um. I want to shout out Feathershell too. She, yes. You know, she said, oh, for sure, being a director is still a dream. And I took an academy class in high school where every kid in that class wanted to be a director. So, yeah, absolutely. And, and with the advent of smartphone technologies and the ability to make high quality, high res movies that easily, I think is making it more, you know, easier oh, it's than awesome. ever. It's yeah. awesome. What you can do with a smartphone yep. 12, you know, is – or with an iPhone 12, excuse me. Yeah. That's what – when – uh. I talked to Robbins not too many days ago, and Robbins is the high school teacher that Justin and I both had 
that was our film and TV teacher. Shout out Robbins. And um, poof. uh, but he was saying, you know, now he's fighting more for computers for the kids to be able to come in and edit because he's like, why would we buy cameras? They got yeah. phones. Mm-hmm. And the phones are going to kick the shit out of whatever camera I get a scrap of money from the administration for. My thing is, how many how many kids do you think growing up that might have wanted to be directors now are just like, I could just be like an Instagram influencer None. or like a content creator? Nope. You don't think? Nope. Zach, if Pixar opened that – or not Pixar. If Paramount opened that door tomorrow – like today. Yeah. And like, Josh, you're a movie director now. I would leave all this shit here. My phone wouldn't even come with me. That's different. I'd be gone. That's different. Yeah. That's different. As I me, don't – As me with uh, the, um, the want to create something, why go through the process of become – trying – going through the channels to become like a film director when I can just make – content for an instagram I but that's that's the difference it. that's the difference between f- true filmmakers is that they are creating for that specific art form and they do it because they have the passion and they love that medium it's the theater you have a ton of cheap people out there and cheap's not the right word but people looking for quick and easy fame through their tiktok shit and they're like there are a million people trying to do the social media influencing and there are a million people are having success with it you know, if you have 10,000 or 50,000 followers and you can get sponsors and all that stuff, it's very, I shouldn't say very easy, but a lot of people can do that. But I think the people that strive to be directors truly love the craft and they love the field. I think, um, and, and I know that they're, they're, we're going to call them TV. You're going to call them TV stars. Finn Wolfhard and Millie Bobby Brown are what I would put my hope on because they could just be TikTok kids. They could have been. They're that perfect age where they should be on TikTok. They should have been on Instagram, but they're actors. Yeah, but are they not also on social media? Millie Bobby Brown has to. Millie Bobby media. Brown is, but I believe she th- thinks of herself as an actress. And Finn Wolfhard thinks of himself as an artist and an actor. But weren't they like acting and then became like social media? Like, right. Yeah. They were actors first. Yeah. Well, that's different. Yeah, I mean, you don't. You're not having people go from being influencers on social media to successful actors. Right. Like people are gonna put those people in movies and like small roles or whatever for their following. But you're not like transitioning from being you not know yet. whoever Vine influencers. But that's did. that's kind of how you guys were painting the picture, to me at least, where you're like, well, social media, you could just be on social media, you could just, but you can't be on social media and then become a movie star. No, I don't think so. No, I, agree. I just because you know the all the, the majority of people on social media are not talented enough to become movie stars, right? But I what the idea with that whole thing was is the exposure to movie stars because you're seeing them so constantly now and you're seeing into their lives, you're seeing where they are and what they're doing and and you know what they're cooking and what they're exercising because you see them every day it takes the allure away from them. And that was such a big part of what it was to be a movie star. Or they weren't that alluring to begin with. Because I guarantee you, Jim Kelly and Dick Van Dyke would have fucking Instagrams and TikToks (coughs) right now. Well, if they were like in today's world, yeah. they would they would nece- they would have to because of the but world. But they would they would lean into it. They would have been people who who jumped on that board because they had so many other talents other than acting mm-hmm. that they would have been like, "Oh, I could I could turn this into this. I could, you know what I mean? Like I I think maybe it just has to do with like I love Brie Larson. She's a great actress, but maybe she's just not that interesting of a person." Right? Because I bet if well, I mean, look at like you know, late night talk show hosts or whatever. Like there are yeah. certainly people who lean into the social media. I mean, have right. and have great success on it. But I don't think you can do that as a movie star. Like there are definitely legions of fans who want to see what Tom Cruise is doing every second of every day. You know, and that's fine because he's already been established as a movie star. But I I just don't think that allows you to become one now with that access. Because the I, the original idea was a movie star. Was it someone that everybody saw on the screen? And then to see them in real life was like, oh, there's this mythical person who I am yeah. now. It's like if you go to Paris and you see the Eiffel Tower in front of you, you're like, I've only ever seen this in pictures for 30 years. And now here it fucking is. Like, that's amazing. Right? Like, it's here's the real thing. So why is that different now? What do you mean? Why is... Like, I think in the next five years we see Chrissy Teigen in movies. 
because she's Chrissy Teigen. No. And she's this I I'm I'm calling it John now. Legend's she's wife. She's barely in yeah. commercials. Yeah. Yeah, but now like especially over quarantine where they're like their online social media presence is so large and she's like a quasi household name. I think in the next five years you see her in movies. I'm sure she would be part of an ensemble. Like yeah. if they did Girls Trip Two, she would be you know one of the girls. I and think. that's why I'm saying like you'll have like the death. You know, like we were talking about like the death of the movie star and the interesting idea because you can just throw together some movie and throw in, throw put fucking Chrissy Teigen in there or whatever. Or like in the in, in the same regard, like I think in the next and I don't mean like a leading role or anything, but in the next five years, I'm sure we see Action Bronson in like three more movies. Uh, I mean, that's why Taylor Swift was in Cats. That's why Harry Styles yeah. was in Dunkirk. I mean, they have those built-in followings. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, maybe Harry Styles really is a great actor. And, you know, he's in Olivia Wilde's new movie, which should be pretty awesome. But, you know, maybe occasionally that person actually is talented enough to cross over. But I, I don't know. Um, Feather Shell's been really active in the chat. I just want to shout yeah. her out. Yeah. Thanks, gal. Um, oh, she was talking about parallel careers with TikTok stars and, and directors. Yeah, I... I kind of think we did the long version yeah. of that but that is yeah i mean yeah. the paul brothers are boxers now right right you yeah. know what i mean like we'll see more influencers that are just actors now crossing that over. might not have yeah. the chops but they have a huge following and they know people will see their movies and, and we, yeah we talked about that in one of our shows where it, it was like you know the casting at the studio is at the back, you know, you have your head, sh- your head shots and your resume, and then you also have a page dedicated to how many social media followers does this person have because that's marketing for the movie. Yeah. And we talked about how, how The Rock does that and everything. But, and it uh, doesn't necessarily even have to be a movie. I know we're, we're a movie show, and that's what yeah. I'm talking about. But, I mean, you see so many TikTok people, or, and I'm so out of the fucking circle of, like, TikTokers and shit. Yes. But I know that they have, like, some of them have, like, albums coming out and shit. Yeah. You know, and it's just going to – I just Not like, because. I know. just think about Vine – that there was like one person that parlayed it into something, and it's the chick on SNL. I don't even know who that wasn't is. King Batch was on Vine, wasn't he? He's yeah, still, he's still pretty big, I think. I don't know what he does. I don't know, but like, <laughs> I don't know what these people um, do, but yeah. I know their names. Yeah, former Vine star on SNL. No, Pete Colin. Davidson. No. no, I don't think so. He's not a Vine star. Former Vine impressionist it's not connor o'malley Mm-mm. it's a it's a woman not jay farrow no that's not right just go to images and see if like somebody why can't i find her is it that like chick with yeah. like the nasal yeah she chloe, talks she chloe talks Feynman. like that oh chloe Feynman. yeah yeah She's, She's not going to do anything more than us. But SNL isn't even fucking funny anymore, you know. No, I. But I. You know what I mean? Like it's it's somebody. I don't think that's her either. But um, but yeah, I think. I don't know, man. I have I have more hope. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, whether or not I'm, I'm right, just naturally I don't know, but... like not an optimistic person. Sure. But you know, I hope it works out. Like yeah. fuck, like. I think the theatrical experience, everyone is writing that movie theaters are dead and dying, and they have been for this whole fucking year, which is just grabbing at news headlines. But they will, movie theaters will survive. People will still want that experience. Um, I think it'll just, it's going to change what is in the theaters for the short term, maybe the long term. Yeah. But that experience is going to be something people still want to have. And I don't think anyone's lost it. I mean, people don't want to go to a theater because there's COVID right now, but they still want to get back oh, to yeah, the theaters. I think people that's still a, I mean that's a guaranteed. What was the last movie you guys saw in theaters? Uh well they've been open here in Pittsburgh for a while, so we've been really lucky yeah. and to be able to go. I've been going to the waterworks pretty frequently. I think the last one I saw was Freaky Did with you Vince like Vaughn. Oh God, that was the worst. It was I I almost walked out of it every five minutes. It was mine so, was, so mine terrible. Was end game. I, I didn't hate it. Oh boy. The Aaron Rodgers mask got me weak as fuck. I was just that was not I was not the crowd for that one. That's yeah. that's fair. That's but uh, I mean, the reviews for it are really great. I mean, so it's it's actually universally pretty. I love the hot chick. The hot chick is like Rob one of Schneider. yeah. It's like one of my <laughs> favorite comedies. Wow, and that's I was a just comedy. like this is this is the hot chick with. It was more the hot chick with Vince Vaughn than it was like a f- Freaky Friday reboot. Yeah, yeah. Um, All right, let's take a commercial break. Let's do it, let's do and it. then we'll get back on the rails with the Family Stone right after this. Please. New Year's Eve 2020. 2020. That was great. That was great. I think there was a lot of good material. Thoughts from the Bench presents... Chips, 
New Year's Rockin' Eve, hosted by Two Beers Deep, starring Austin Moorhead of the Rank King's Court, Tom Dubay and Ryan Mitchell of Boondock Bangarang, Justin Boyd from The Idiot Hour, plus Justin Luteran and Zach Taylor from Thoughts from the Movies. With special guests, Mac Dre and Brooksy from Heart of the Order, Benny Buckets and Smalls from The Vault, plus By the Wayside Coffee, Abby and DJ Denny. Starting at 4 p.m. on New Year's Eve, only on Twitch. We're calling it the idiot hour. Hey, Denny Hamlin, new NASCAR fan here. You really gotta like, but you gotta like blow. He wears the skull of his dead mother. <laughs> and then when he finally copes with the death of his mother, he becomes his mother. He becomes Marowak. Correction, Obi is the greatest offensive talent we've ever seen. I am E. You dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to Thoughts from the Movies. Uh, in lieu of time, we're going to jump ahead a little bit. And we're going to go to Dream Rom-Com Cast. That way we don't have to talk about the Family Stone as much as possible. <laughs> um, God bless. Right. Uh, Zach, you want me to go first? Yeah, All go right, for it. Sweet. Let me tell you guys about this little movie I came up with earlier today. This Rom-Com Cast is led by Zoe Deschanel. Basically, she's going to be Jess from New Girl. Her brother is Paul Rudd, who's a successful lawyer married to a smart-ass Alec wife, Sarah Chalk. Oh. Yeah, you didn't gross. see that coming. Holla. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know who that is. Who also is Zoe Deschanel's gynecologist. Yeah. What? <laughs> that's important to the movie because that's how Zoe Deschanel finds out her ex-boyfriend, Adam Driver, was cheating on her. Because she got a uh, venereal disease that oh she boy. didn't have previous, finds out Adam Driver's cheating around on her, right? Mm. Um, Zoe Deschanel is a teacher at uh, a local elementary school. Uh, and she's really kind of like in this weird you know, moment in her life where she's like broken up with this guy she thought she was going to marry. She cheated on him, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And Paul Rudd and Sarah uh, Chalk are going to keep her from going back to Adam Driver. Uh, luckily, though, there will be a new man in uh, her life uh, who's the principal at uh, the school she teaches. That is William Jackson Harper, a.k.a. Cheaty from The Good Place. Oh, cool. Um, and he's essentially just going to be Cheaty, but as a principal of an elementary school. Um, it Jack, should do, you, be... do you like The Good Place? Uh, I've seen a couple episodes. I, I, I wouldn't know the character by okay. name. Okay. Uh, so Kristen Stewart or not? Uh, yeah, not Kristen Stewart. Yeah, it's not Kristen Wiig either. <sighs> Kristen Bell, maybe from the Good yeah. Place. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, Kristen Bell's partner in the Good Place. Okay, is is Cheedy. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's that's the rom com. I got my dream girl Zoe Deschanel in there. Um, I think she's single now too. So well, you're married, but I am married. Yeah. Uh, Forgot. Yeah, she's also like forty now. Eh, okay, that's kind of a big jump for me. I'm pretty immature, thirty year old. <laughs> I'm just putting it out there. Yeah, but I feel like she's such a you know dorky forty year old. It's Probably. Like, it's whatever. Probably. I love Zoe. I love Zoe. Uh, Zoe Deschanel is my leading lady. I love uh, William Jackson Harper. I have big hopes for him moving forward. Um, he was great as Cheedy. Obviously, I put Paul Rudd in there because he's the greatest actor of a generation. Uh, Sarah Chalk is having a renaissance as a voice actress, and I want to see her back in front of the camera. Uh, and then Adam Driver's just a fucking – he can do everything. Love it. Nice. So, yeah. Very solid. I, I very romantic. Movie. Very fun. Yeah, I'd watch it. Zach, you want to go next? Yeah. Uh, this is all kind of off the cuff here, but let's say uh... – I kind of liked your plot. I'm going to roll with your plot, and I'm just going to recast your movie mm -hmm. because uh, I want to. I mean, it's a pr pretty typical trope rom-com thing. Yeah. Pull, pull your thing back up there so yeah. I can kind of bracket my 
let's see here so my leading lady would be my leading lady for everything and it's not lucy lou I kind of, oh man i kind not... of i kind of forgot to mention her the last couple episodes so that's dead, whatever yeah uh skojo oh yeah i mean mrs colin jost you mean yeah <laughs> yeah never I'll, hey I'm man for that it's just proof crash. that nice guys can finish first every once in a while <laughs> That's what I just I hold on to. Nice. Yeah. I'll take that. Yeah. Now I, I want to cast her with somebody that doesn't make sense. Just like like her man's like this like schlubby dude, you know. And I feel like the easy Jack Black. The easy way out is Jack Black. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm going Louis Guzman. Louis Guzman. Yeah. <laughs> That's he used to I follow me guy. on Instagram. He no used to way. On my old account. Yeah. Uh, he's so funny. Louis from the hood. He's so freaking funny. He's from anger management. Yeah. I told you not to go there. Yeah. <laughs> I told you not to go there. <laughs> Why? He's so funny. What? It's what? a ro- it's a rom com. No, that's not a rom com. It's just he's, fucking weird. He's hilarious. He's got a good personality. I like it. He's funny. Okay. I'm on, I'm on. All right. Louis all right. I'm all right. All right. Keep Louis going. Keep going. Keep going. Um. So her wild pick. <laughs> so her her like girlfriend. You know, I'm going with um, Laura Lupkiss, the chick from The Wrong Missy. I don't know who that is. Uh, good luck spelling this because I could have pronounced it. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think she's hilarious. She's, yeah, she is. She's the she's guard oh. in Orange is the New Black. Yeah, yeah okay. she's in a lot. She's awesome. There's a Netflix show I think called The Characters. Yeah, and she her she's the first episode and yeah, it, it's it fucking kills me. Um, the guy friend mm-hmm. for um, Louis Guzman will be Idris Idris Elba. What kind of fucking movie are you making? Because it doesn't make sense. Because he should be the leading man. Yeah. Yeah. Is ScarJo going to fall for him? Nope. He could do something really fun with it. Be like really off the wall, Idris Elba. Yeah. Like Chris Hemsworth in uh, Ghostbusters. Remember? as like the, the smart guy who's in it. Or the, the idiot receptionist. Do you see the new Ghostbusters? No, but now no. that I know Chris Hemsworth. Chris Hemsworth, Hemsworth plays like it. the receptionist at Ghostbusters. And he's like a handsome idiot. Like yeah. it's very funny. Yeah. I like, mean, like a Channing Tatum in like Twenty One Jump Street. Yeah. Listen, yeah, yeah, yeah. the yeah. three Chris's can know do no wrong in my book. Okay. Yeah, how you, feel about you don't need to preach yeah. to me about a yeah. Christmas movie which will be made. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So we got our leading man, our leading woman, their friends. Yeah. And then what was the last ex boyfriend or the ex girlfriend? So it'll be ex girlfriend. Okay. <laughs> This has to be – you have to find somebody prettier than ScarJo at this point. No, Judy Dench. Oh, Judy. Dame Judy Dench. Dame have some Judy, respect. Dame Judy Dench. Put some respect on her name. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute. Actually, I all of a sudden oh. love this movie. Yeah. Um, this movie is like the the fake movie that they're watching in that episode of The Office with Jack Black. Yeah. <laughs> She's going yeah. up the stairs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like Andy's yeah. like, I should be a food critic. Sandwiches are uh, bad. <laughs> yeah. So like, weird. That's, e- either that's her or movie. like Helen Mirren. Uh, no, Jane Bro. Judy Dane Judy Jens is, is that's it, man. Yeah. Because her kissing the other guy. Is priceless. That like that clip alone is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. All right. No, that was yeah. Cloris Leachman in the Office clip. Yeah. 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 yeah no, I, I know. I was just. It. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, same thing. Old, it's it's kind of like old, that movie. And it'll movie. be there will be like a scene where like Gojo's like like how did you meet and he'll be like oh yeah we met at like a yoga class. He's like Obviously. I met her at a yoga class. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he'll be gay in this movie. Oh yeah, too. yeah, be, yeah. He'll be <laughs> yeah. so obviously yeah. gay, but not. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. my. And Adrian Elba's like, I just don't get it. Yeah. Nice. What was that shitty movie with like? It was like, oh, so many. Was it like movie forty three? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. It was yeah. Like all the vignettes. Yeah, 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 yeah it'll yeah, be yeah. like movie forty three, but as a rom com. We're just nice. like. Sense. It'll um, do terrible. It'll be the worst movie ever. I'm kind of into it. It's I my passion it. project. Now. I mean, it's no a Christmas movie. But uh, you a know, Christmas, Chris, a Chris Christmas, yeah, Chris Christmas, nice. Uh, okay, you're up. 
Here is mine. I did a similar pattern as you guys. So this is what we're doing again with dream rom-com casts. If we were to make our own rom-com movie. Um, the is that your dream? Zach? <laughs> it's my, wet, it's my wet dream. <laughs> I dream about Luis Guzman every night. Him in that fucking Dude, fishnet shirt. Every every flying night. out in yeah. a scene. Yeah. Who doesn't? I yeah. love it. Gummy up, bitch. <laughs> okay. Uh, so my dream rom-com, the, fem- the female love interest is going to be Brie Larson, <laughs> Duh. who has uh, supplanted Emma Watson as being the future ex-wife of mine Wow. Uh, that I focused all my attention on. Uh, the male love interest in the movie is going to be me, obviously, playing opposite against Brie Larson. I mean, you are on that poster in the Pittsburgh airport the one time. Boom. That's basically a movie star. Uh, basically Shit. a movie star. This is how. This is my master plan to get Brie and I together. Wow. So okay. Brie and I are leading the way of this one. Very Mr. and Mrs. Smith of you. I'm into it. Yeah. Our parent, or I guess these will be, we'll call them my parents, whichever, fa- well, the family parents of the okay. house that we okay. go to stay at. Okay. Okay. I'm going to, I took your Helen Mirren or you took okay. my Helen Mirren. Playing opposite Bob Kelso as oh, the crazy, man. angry grandfather, father character, uh, who I love insanely, insanely very much. Um, Helen Mirren and Bob Kelso from Scrubs are the parents. Um, the crazy uncle slash... Played mis- by Kevin Jenkins. Ken Jenkins, yes. Uh, the crazy uncle slash oh miscellaneous weird relative, like the Randy Quaid character from uh, Christmas uh, Vacation in the Vacation movies. Gilbert Gottfried. We're yes. going to go throw him. Uh, We're going to throw him in that house. Uh, yes. Or I can't do his voice anymore. But uh, if he's still alive, we'll I throw just, him. I just like Gilbert Gottfried and Bob Kelso having scenes together at like an awkward oh, yeah. breakfast. Oh, yeah. I'm here for it. Dad, can you pass the jelly? Yeah, you know, like, yeah. Son, what the hell are you saying? Yeah. yeah. No, that would be. I thought you moved out of the house a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that, so he's the crazy uncle character. Okay. The wily sister. Oh, uh, I don't know. The whoever. Rachel McAdams character. Yeah. Maria Bakalova, who recent audiences will know as uh, Tutar from Borat 2. Sasha Baron Cohen's daughter. You spell that from, shit so wrong. The Google new, just said yeah. no. Yeah, you were close there. <laughs> yeah. She is outrageous in the new Borat movie. Okay. And I would love to have her in this as okay. like, pretty much that character. Okay. Uh, in this like movie. Uh, Bree's ex-boyfriend is going to be played by Jay Baruchel. I'm going to keep the bar really low on that one so I look real good against uh, Jay, who you guys know as being part of like uh, the Seth director of Goon. That's who I yeah. know him as. He was in uh, She's really? Out of My League and such. Yeah, he and, directed uh, Goon. No idea. Yeah, Goon 1 and 2. I don't think anyone knows him as that. but uh, uh, That's what I know yeah, him He's as. in Knocked Up and all those movies. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, he's Breeze X, so there's uh, no pressure there. No, I and then good. my streetwise uh, best friend in the movie will be played by none other than Jason Siegel. Nice. I can't cast you in the movie. I nice. cast, cast yourself. Well, yeah, but against opposite Brie, I no. can't use too many real life people. I mean, Jason Siegel as the one who's always going to lead me down the right path. Say, dude, what are you doing here? Jason Siegel is so slept on. He knows yeah. everything. So underrated. Is that yeah. good or bad? Slept on. Is that good? Yeah, okay. underrated. Okay, underrated. underrated. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I slept on him. He was underrated. I don't know. It means people are sleeping on him, like they don't give him the credit he deserves. Well, everyone should wake up because he's amazing. He is yeah. amazing. Uh, yeah, Jason Siegel would round out the cast in that one. Um. I also had this. Um, oh, God. Also, speaking of rom-coms, the five-year engagement's probably the best rom-com oh, in like, yeah. the last like, ten years. The five-year engagement is good. It's like It feels like it's five years. It's a oh. real long movie. Yeah, it is. But other than that, it's pretty solid. If they just trimmed like 20 minutes off that movie, it'd be real good. Rachel Brosnahan from yeah. Marvel's Mrs. Maisel. So I thought – and I only had two characters, but Rachel Brosnahan and Donald Glover – Mm. Are the 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 couple getting together in a rom com? Yeah, electric. That would be great. That's an interesting combo. For that sure. would be very fucking funny. Yeah, they're I would, both I would like that. brilliant comedic actors. Okay, so I would be into nice. that. Um, all right, and then we're gonna do better or worse to end the show. <laughs> Was the big sick better or worse than the Family Stone? Oh, better, for sure. Yeah. Big Sick is a great movie. Have you guys yeah. seen The Big Sick? I have not. It is on my short list. It's very witty. I mean, it's like it's a romantic comedy with, like, there's sort of an element of, like, one of them is sick type of thing. Right. But it's most of the movie is very charming and very smartly written. How do you say his name? Uh, Kumail. Yeah. And Johnny. Yeah. And uh, this is based on, like, how he actually met his wife in this movie. It's, like, based on their story, which is nice. Well, hmm. he's who's he married to? Emily Gordon. That's right. Yeah. yeah Emily V. Gordon. Yeah. 
And Zoe Kazan in this is obviously very charming. She's Paul Dano's girlfriend and did Ruby Sparks, and she did What If with Daniel Radcliffe, and she very much comes from that sort of quirky indie uh, world. So, yeah, Big Six is a really good movie. Awesome. Justin, is Annie Hall better than The Family Stone? I feel I just feel like I can't even take it seriously now at this point. You're targeted. Oh, man. Is it better? Of course it's better. It's Annie Hall. It's Best Picture winner. I will say I was, I'm was i personally a fan of Manhattan over Annie Hall in terms of uh, those Woody Allen movies, but Annie Hall is a freaking classic. Zach, both star Diane Keaton. <laughs> when you put it that way. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. I mean, I have one at yeah. me, bro. Like at me. I can't argue with yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've never seen Annie Hall. Oh, okay. That's okay. Woody Allen creeps me the fuck I've out. I've also though. never seen Annie so Hall, so you're good. I, oh, what are, we, what are we doing? I'd here? rather watch The Family Stone again, I think. <laughs> Yeah, it's just weird because Woody Allen is always playing opposite like babes, yeah, like, cool cool chicks in his movies, yeah. and he's just like the worst. You're like, this is unrealistic. Yeah. I hate this. Yeah, like you. Well, I mean, not unrealistic. Opposite, if you're Woody uh, Allen, you can yeah, get Brie Larson. You can get your daughter if you want. Brie and okay. I will be happy someday, okay. and you won't be invited to the wedding. I doubt that. Uh, Silver Lining Playbook. You guys see this one? One of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, well, the uh, way you said that was like, oof. Yeah, I saw it. I don't think there's a better. I I think this is one of the best on screen duos. Absolutely. Because what do they have? They have this. They have joy. Mm -hmm. They have American Hustle. American Hustle. I mean, yeah. All, like, not, all David O. Russell movies. Yeah, not. I mean, not even close by a. They're like an unfathomable amount. You yeah. Know? Eh, they're fine. Their age difference, I think, is really noticeable. Oh, I, I meant these two. I meant awkward. these two movies. Wait, what? I I I meant like oh, I meant like by an unfathomable amount. Like Silver Lining Playbook is better oh, than a Family yeah, Stone. But yeah, I will yeah, say yeah, that yeah. I, I stand by like I think on screen like I do too. chemistry wise. I think they're I think. awesome. Okay, I love both of the actors. I it's a great movie. Silver Lining is definitely better than Family Stone. Okay. How about the most famous scene in rom com history? Say anything. Against the Family Stone. And my man, John Cusack. Better than, for yeah. sure. Yeah. John, it's a classic. Yeah. yeah, Classic of an era. Teen romance. Yeah. It's the John classic. Hughes uh, gang. Inspired yeah. the Nikki FM video. Yes. And the Nikki FM song. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is, is going to sound weird. <laughs> I love this fucking movie. Is this the one where he bangs Kathy Bates? No, this is uh with um Helen, Hunt's Helen Hunt Helen yeah. Hunt and the dog and uh the, like the gay neighbor with the little dog that and Greg Kinnear is Jack that? Nicholson has yeah. to babysit the dog and like Helen Hunt's naked in the bathtub and he draws her and they like have like a night drinking wine and she's just walking around the apartment naked and then Jack Nicholson's like you spent the night with that and then he calls him the f word and she goes he gave me more with never touching me than you ever could and it, it's like oh. a great scene oh it's an awesome movie I uh, and I don't remember if I've seen this one all the way through or not I don't remember it if I have if it's not the one with Kathy Bates I don't think I've seen it oh uh, it's it's You're awesome. talking about misery what do you which which one with Kathy Bates isn't there one about? where like Kathy Bates is like naked in a hot tub with Jack Nicholson uh I have no idea if that's true at all. About Schmidt, <laughs> the, yeah, one where he's real, the one where he's real depressed. I don't think I've seen any, any of these movies. Actually, never mind. Okay, oh, she, is, right. she is in that movie. That was yeah. a wild so, dream you uh, had. No, I swear there's a movie where Kathy Bates is like naked and all. No, I mean it, they're both in this movie. As is your boy Josh Dermot Mulroney from uh, The Family Stone. Yeah. So there you go. There you go. Six degrees of separation. All right. Uh, we just talked about the five year engagement, how awesome that movie is a little bit. Um It's it's like it's good but it's long. That's what it's I It's very long. It. It's better very than long. Family Stone. Yeah. Definitely too long. What's that movie from? About Schmidt. About yeah. Schmidt. Okay, yeah. there yeah. you go. All right. I'm gonna set that as my screensaver. There you go. Um Kathy Bates. I love Why didn't we cast Kathy Bates? Kathy we Bates fucked in up. The hot tub. I should cast her in everything. She's awesome. Hot no, I want that chick. Devil. I want that chick from uh, um, I think she died this year or last year from Mr. Deeds. She's like, I'm gonna slice you into betcharoni. I don't know. Oh okay. Oh, I know. Yeah, the yeah. one who works at the pizza shop. Yeah, Mr. yeah, yeah. Deeds. She's yeah. like a husky she tackles, older lady. Yeah, she tackles uh, Winona Ryder at the end. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I love the five year engagement. It's probably one of my. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I just love the movie. It's 
there's so many good there's so many good scenes in it okay. yeah there she is uh the five-year engagement yeah, yeah. The, when they're at the when they're at the flower shop and he's like she's like showing them like the white She's like, these are lovely white peonies. Uh-huh. And they're like all like fucked up. And he's like, I heard the black peonies are like much larger. Oh. And she's like, <laughs> she's like, oh, I didn't know that. And then the one guy, it's he used to be on SNL and shit. And he says like, he like fucks it up. He's like, you like black penis? And they're, she, they're just like, bro, like what the fuck? <laughs> this, it's an all time scene. I do love both of those actors. Probably the ultimate Second ultimate rom com, Pretty Woman. The most realistic of all rom coms, I think you could call it. Sar- <laughs> sarcasm, dude. Sarcasm. Okay. Josh's like, what are you talking what about? What the fuck are you talking <laughs> no about? No way. Uh, but definitely Big better. mistake. Huge. Yeah. I've never seen it. Oh, dude. Oh, Pretty it. Woman's awesome. It's, it's, it's delightful. Fun. It's delightful. Yeah, I mean, it's I like Richard fun. Gere, and I like Julie Roberts, but I've yeah. just never she's, seen Yeah, her. she's a stripper uh, with a heart of gold. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Nailed it. Uh, not a stripper with a heart of gold, but does have a strip scene. P.S. I love you. Uh, I think these are closer than you would think. Fuck you. I agree. You would Fuck th- you both. It's a weird fucking movie. It's not. It's. It's. Oh, man. I like. I, I do like P.S. I love you. And it's just. I think if you thought about it, like it's long. It does a lot of kind of goofy things like it's. It's. No, I ugly cry through P.S. I Love You the whole way through. I watch it once a year just to cry. Don't up and down me. I'm, yeah, Mr. Not, Watches fucking veterans come home to make himself cry. You can't kink shame me. I told you that in confidence. <laughs> <laughs> you told me that on a podcast. Yeah, no. Yeah. No. Uh, I yeah. Think P.S. I Love You is better than, but they're closer than you think. That's what You're I'm full of to. shit. Yeah, like, I get it. But, like, as somebody that cries during movies a lot, I don't think I – I don't think it like hit oh with my me. P.S. I love you tries to do too much, like for the romantic genre between like you know the friends and the death and like the Ireland stuff and everything. Yeah. Like, new romantic interest. Like there's a lot going on in the that fuck one. Fuck is happening. And the cast is like iffy. Don't I mean, you even fucking open your mouth, Justin Luteran. Jump, yeah, Gerard Butler I is my agree. boy for life, but the rest of the cast is like not really movie stars. Hillary Swank has an Oscar. Yeah, she's Kathy not Bates. For this movie. Lisa Kudrow. Not for this movie. Yeah. Eh. The supporting cast in this one is iffy. Jeffrey Dean Morgan, like, eh. Yeah. Lisa Kudrow and then her other friend who is, shall remain nameless. I mean, yeah. They're closer than you think. You're just so, you just love P.S. I Love You so much. And I like P.S. I Love You. I own the movie. I love the soundtrack. You know. Yeah. They're closer than you think. It's not great. Yeah, it's not like it's Harry Connick Jr.'s in it. I mean, yeah, that's like on. the only highlight. <laughs> uh, oh, you've got males on screen now. Uh, yeah, you've got male is better than Family Stone for sure. But that's like that was Tom and Meg. <laughs> Meg Ryan, oh, she's the, just she's a nobody actress. Tom Hanks never heard of that guy. No, Meg Ryan's essentially Sarah Jessica Parker. This is no Sarah Jessica Parker sucks. This is yeah. the this movie would never get made today, and this is a great example of those old school movies. You have these two movie stars at the height of their powers, and they made all you know like four movies in a row together, and people loved all of them. Yeah, this movie's great. It's classic. I would love to watch it now in 2020 with like the dial up internet of it all, and just it's try. Awesome. I'd try to relate to it. I think we like, watched it last year. It's oh god, pretty, it's still pretty great. If you showed this to like a 19 year old, they'd be like, "What the hell is?" Well, this and movie? like Tom Hanks owns a bookstore. Yeah, like that alone is like a bizarre thought in 2020. Nobody born in 2000 or later will ever watch this movie. I don't no, think. probably not. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. But what are you guys saying? Better than worse than? I think it's better than. I don't know. Stuff. My entire perception has been skewed at this point. I do. I still like P.S. I love you. But Fuck I just, off. I, if you re, if you think about it, they're closer than you think. I think you're you're both really wrong on yeah. this. I agree to disagree. The, what? There's that scene where they go to like, she does like karaoke or yeah. whatever. Yeah. It sucks. No, that's awesome. It's not. She's like, he's like, not. oh, I love, but my wife won't get up here. And she just like puts the beer bottle down. And she goes, how much? It's fucking awesome. See, I think it hit for you the way they intended it to. <laughs> <laughs> I think they got you. They got me. They did not get me. They got yeah. me. Accent is terrible. Yeah. 
It's I need to rewatch it, dude. Right, so like right. And then yeah, he's not uh, a great actor. Sings... Who? Gerard Butler. He's Gerard Butler's great. a better actor than you think. He's just in shitty movies. And he but sings he's, Galway he's Girl actor. and then Galway like, Girl, yeah. Oh, it's awesome. There are some moments in that movie that get me. On a day, I, I, yeah. fuck you guys. That movie's great. I'm gonna go. Home I just and watch I don't like Hillary Swank. I think it's part of it too. She's great. Is Hillary Swank hot? <laughs> Don't even get a start on that one. That's a whole show right there. You're saying yeah. Hillary Swank's a hot bitch. I'm not hot. I know. Definitely not. Uh, all right. That was a surprisingly good episode. That was we're a having great to talk about the family stuff for two hours. We did a lot with a little there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but not talking about it, we had a great episode. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. It was the only way. No, I do want to do a, a bigger, a deeper dive into rom-coms at some point, though, because it is a genre that a movie that I do personally love um, and I think is underrated because it has created a number of stars and has created some of the most memorable lines in movie history. Something about Mary or uh, not something about Mary. A great movie, but that's not what I was thinking of when Harry met Sally. Um, you know, has so many amazing lines from it and, and other, ama- you know, Pretty Woman. Or just I'm huge, looking up you know. real quick what the what a recent romantic comedy was. Like to see when the last good one was. Probably Big Sick. That wasn't on Netflix. The Lovebirds was fat. Palm Springs was okay, but that was just Groundhog's Day. And again, that's streaming. That was Hulu. Like in theaters, the last romantic comedy. Yeah, the Big Sick was a few years ago, and I think I honest to God think that that was the last one that came out in yeah. theaters. To all the boys I loved before, people really like on Netflix. But yeah, it's just it's a dying it's dying breed romantic comedies. We need uh we we're talking about bringing back the sh- uh the store and I think we need a uh a shirt in the store under thoughts from movies called rom it says like rom-com guy or bring back rom-coms. <laughs> I'd buy that shirt. Yeah, yeah I'd wear that. Bring nice. back rom-coms. Um all right. Thank you guys for joining as always. Uh this has been thoughts from the movies tomorrow. Chips New Year's Rockin' Eve. It is going to be a train wreck um, in the best way possible. Every single show from the platform of Thoughts from the Bench will make an appearance on the show for at least half an hour. It will give everybody a taste of, of anything you can consume in 2021 as uh, Thoughts from the Bench is going to attempt to take a huge step forward and take over at least Pittsburgh. Yeah, why not? Yeah, Pittsburgh. Yeah. Maybe Sh- just the North Shore. Shoot for Pittsburgh, hit Cleveland. Yeah. Or whatever. Hey, now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks for watching, guys. See you next week. See you.